Would you all please rise for a moment of silence? You may be seated. We're calling the meeting to order. This is a study session of the board on master facility planning and district leadership will now lead the presentation. We want to apologize to leadership that we are, we are late in getting here, but sometimes that happens with business that we have to attend to that's um, really important. So um, we appreciate your patience. And without further ado, I, I do believe Ms. Dr. Forlis will start. And I think Dr. Strom might have something to do with the rest of this. So We have a team. We have a team for you this afternoon, uh, Madam President, members of the board. Uh, we are going to uh, walk through a master planning presentation with you. What you will see are that there are six modules that we will uh, go through and there are four strategies. And after each one of the modules, we have a question that we would love for you to engage in. It is our hope that uh, you provide us insights, that you provide your reflections, you provide your interests to us um, as we work through each of these modules. Uh, this has a, been a tremendous undertaking and we are very proud to share the work that has been done thus far. So Mrs. Williams will um, get started and then we will have Dr. Strom and Mr. Thompson join in as well throughout the presentation. So with that, uh, Mrs. Williams. Great, thank you, Dr. Forlis. Um, it's my pleasure tonight to share with you um, some information about our master planning and the work we've been doing. We have a lot of information to share with you and we've built in some time for some conversation, but we always like to start um, grounded in our portrait of a graduate and our promise that we every student in Mesa is known by name, served by strength and need, and graduates ready for college, career, and community. Hopefully you'll see that reflected in some of the decisions we've made through the years and some of the recommendations that we'll make going forward. Um, knowing that in order to serve our students best, we have to live into this promise 100%. So we keep this in mind in all of our work. As Dr. Forler shared with you, we have broken the presentation into modules. And uh, the six modules that we have here, you'll see that we have um, different, different topics that we're gonna discuss. We have time within each of them for a conversation of the board. Um, um, as we move through, just some reflection questions and some feedback we're looking for. Um, your reactions, your, your guidance on, on, on the direction that we're taking. So I'll start with module one um, and then my teammates will go in. Um, module one is the master plan report. And those of you who are around however many years ago, remember those clickers and how excited our community was to participate by, via clicker. So um, take you in the way back machine. It is, yeah. Can you, do I need to get a little closer maybe? Okay, is that better? Great. Um, okay, Marcy and Kian, I have a, a trivia question for you. Do you remember when the master plan report was presented? <laughs> Very good. Do you, yeah, way to cheat. <laughs> do you, that's right. Yeah, you can read the date, but do you remember what's important about that date? It was the last board meeting before the world stopped. So right before COVID, this is the last board meeting we had right before everything happened, right? So you're gonna see today that while we've made progress on this, in some cases, maybe not as quickly as we had liked because we had to pause for a moment and readjust and our focus was diverted for a bit. But I am I'm excited to share with you some of the things that we've done and how far we've come based on this report. So for those of you who weren't on the board, we've partnered with Alpha and MGT and Alpha and MGT um, led us through a facility assessment um, and gave us a facility condition index for each of our schools and our, our district office buildings. And they also were part of tagging all of our mechanical equipment to make moving forward easier um, to do work orders, 
and to do um, um, scheduled maintenance and things. So we have everything tagged. We know where everything is. And uh, we use the system to this day to make our lives easier in the work order system and in our operations department. So the timeline. In, um, we, uh, we hired MGT in March of 2019. And then we took the spring and fall of 2019 to do those assessments of the buildings. And during that time also, we held six community stakeholder meetings where we went out and we did a twofold. We asked them um, what they were feeling about facilities and what they wanted for their children. And we also asked for their, remember we used that to ask about the strategic plan and our promise and got a lot of really good feedback during that time. That was very highly engaged um, stakeholders. Those six meetings were well attended and we got lots of data from that. MGT then used that to help make some of the recommendations that they made to the governing board in February of 2020. So I'm just, I pulled a page out of the reports. These are the recommendations that MGT put together as a summary page. They um, reminded us at our capacity that at the high schools, we were over capacity by at 110%. Um, and, and the reason for that, um, for those of you who have maybe haven't been dialed into this report as much, um, we moved ninth graders um, to the high schools and we added classrooms, but we didn't add the auxiliary spaces. Think cafeterias, think performance spaces, think gymnasiums. So when you look at a utilization of a campus, um, we added 900 students with not the requisite space to handle everything that they need to do. So, um, so their recommendation was to take a look at um, our, our size and take a look at how do we address those concerns. Our Jude, yeah, Joe. Since this was projecting in 2024 and it's now 2024, did that projection pan out? Is that how, where we are now? We're or? very close, yes. Okay. Um, the, the, each high school they projected out um, to be how utilized they are. They anticipated um, Skyline and Dobson being a little less and that's, that is panning out, yes, with our other four high schools remaining quite large. Our junior highs, um, this also um, was similar in nature, that, but we were underutilized in many of our junior highs, but not to a level that was concerning. It was about what we would expect. It's considered average utilization. With high, um, at the time, Taylor was the highest um, utilization. They have dropped a little. Their enrollment has gone down a smidge, but, but they were the highest in, at 88%. And then our elementaries, um, they were... 78% utilized, but remember we had some very low utilized and very some very high, so that's the average, um, and it was considered appropriate. There were some things that they asked us to consider, which is desired elementary school size and a combined approach to how we address elementary schools and the programs that are offered there, and later in the presentation you'll see how we've addressed these recommendations. Overall facilities, they talked about renovating the, and replacement of the highest need, standardizing the school sizes and program enhancement. You won't see necessarily the standardization of school size, but we'll tell you how we're addressing school size um, throughout this program. But um, for sure, we've done renovation and replacement and um, program enhancements by some of the moves that we made last year, including Sarine and Jordan and those kind of things. So if I'm taking you back, this is an actual picture from those community engagement. Um, sessions, um, in, in, I think this might have been Red Mountains Library, I, or maybe Dobson's, um, but these were the things that came out of the conversation. High themes, safety and security, the idea of um, a diverse uh, options for facilities, that the portrait of the graduate was, was there, and that we had good building conditions. I will tell you that MGT mentioned, and our, we have lots of visitors on our campuses, Many people are amazed that our schools are as old as they are because our operations department does such an outstanding job maintaining our buildings. Every time we have visitors come to like Westwood and they go to the new building and then they go to our older buildings, they're always amazed that the quality is, is a, a great standard. Um, there are things that we could do better, but um, overall, and I, the speech and debate folks that were here last summer were amazed when I told them how old our buildings were because they were in such good shape. The other things that um, community asked for, these were the crucial elements that they asked for, was that we address um, having classrooms that met the portrait of a graduate standards so that they were more flexible, that students could be grouped in different ways, that it's not just a chair desk combo that takes a lot of work to move into a group. 
um, that we keep up with our conditions of our facilities and our capacity, and that we are very clear with how the money is spent um, via bond and um, um, specifically bond when it came at this time. This is what they were talking about. So from there, we took this um, information and made decisions. As um, we, we addressed our use the facility condition index to inform what HVAC systems need to be replaced first. And we've talked about that quite a bit in here around how we spend our ESSER monies and our other construction projects. And part of that um, prioritization was based directly off this master plan report. We also um, recognized that the utilization rates were um, something we had to address at our two high school at our high schools overall. And we went to the, the two highest um, two highest utilized were the, next, the first two schools we addressed, and that was Mesa High and Mountain View. Um, and so we, we spent considerable bond dollars addressing those concerns. And then we also realized from our utilization rates through that study that we had the ability to increase our preschool programming. And you've seen in our enrollment presentations how well that's working for us, that we've, we've increased our enrollment in preschool significantly. And that's a direct result from using the, MC, um, the FCI report from MGT. The other influences, and I spoke about these a little bit ago, so I'm not gonna go over them all, but the, the changes we've made about reconfiguring to K-8s, the being able to co-locate the Bezos Academies, and the idea that we um, have changed space um, as needed for community needs or community um, priorities. You saw that in our Franklin at Alma and our Mesa Center for Success and our Sarine. Um, those were opportunities that we had to um, use the master plan report to make informed decisions about moving moving some of these program um, changes forward. This is an interesting slide, just so you know, if community members are asking you, <laughs> how, how does this work? Um, we got a lot of buildings. And uh, again, a celebration, we take really good care of 874 buildings and our one vacant lot. <laughs> so, um, from the recommendations made in 2019, this is a reflection question for the board and the work MPS has done since then. What are your thoughts? So I'm gonna pause right there. Board member, thoughts, concerns, questions? Dr. O'Reilly. I'll just start with a question. Just as I was looking at this, this afternoon I was, elementary, junior, and high school, they say, uh, determine we're gonna determine desired sizes for our schools do we, i know we there used to be a rule of thumb do we have something like that you know we've avoided kind of setting a number to things and talked more about how do we program them specifically for student needs so i wouldn't tell you that we have a uh, high school has to be this size or can be no bigger or an elementary or junior high rather if we have extra space how are we using it how are we co-locating programs or how are we looking to expand the population there so um while it used to be, that doesn't exist at this time. Okay. It just struck me that that was in there repeatedly, so I thought I didn't hear a discussion about a specific number, but it sounded like there was going to be one, so yeah. I just wondered. Okay. Yeah, that was a recommendation they made, and, and, and I, later on in the presentation, we'll show you how we've addressed that um, without, without setting a level, um, but rather talking about um, the programming. Any other questions? Are there any other campuses, and if it's too, maybe it's too early to say if it's confidential, but looking at K through eight, you said we listed the ones we did here. Is this gonna be later in the presentation? Oh, oh yes. No. Um, so, yes. well, um, we're gonna talk more about uh, a philosophy of it, but we don't have specific campuses set yet. But there are some things that we wanna talk about, about um, changing the environment a little. Um, that we do have identified, but we haven't said this school, this school, this school. So it'll it'll make more sense in a little bit, I promise. All right, thank you. Uh -huh. And I would think a lot of that is organic as well, as 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 staffs come together and and go. Wait a minute, we've got we've got resources, we've got people. We could we could do. Yeah, that's a good way to think about it. Yes. Um, I'm wondering, would it be wise to hold community meetings again? Um, in that, um, I, I know the city has is doing their um, their their um, surveys of and having community meetings and preparation for their bond. But you know, it's been five years, and and um, we've had COVID, and um, we've had a bond defeat, 
and I'm wondering, um, would it be wise to hold community meetings um, in the next school year? I think that the timing of that will be important. I think that that's very much something we should do. Okay. Um, I, I think timing it appropriately so that we don't get too far out and people don't see any work being done. They ask for things and then we can't do it. Um, so we'll have to think through that. But yes, I wanted to share with you also that we are continuing. We started in the fall um, planning for Red Mountain and Skyline. Those are the next two high schools um, that have not yet been refreshed. Um, and so we are continuing that community engagement there. So we have met with students, staff, teachers, and now we have a steering committee identified and we'll be meeting with them next week to continue the conversation. So there are community meetings ha happening um, with uh, I around those big high schools and what do, what do the communities want? Okay, thank you. Thank President you. Hutchinson also, um, to answer a larger picture of that, that is one of our uh, takeaway questions at the end is what we would love some uh, feedback on an execution timeline from the board. So that would be, when we talk execution, that always includes community engagement. Thank you very much. It was good to have a refresh of our memories. Right. Mm -hmm. Truly. Right. That, and you. that's, that's you know, take you down memory lane for a minute. That's so right. now I'm going to pass it to uh, Dr. Strom, who's going to talk to you about Module 2. Thank you, Dr. Strom. We'll go ahead and, oh, there you go. Thank you, Chad. I taught computer programming for a while in C Sharp, and it reminded me of Hello World. I am here. Here we go. Uh, so we have an enrollment in public elementary and secondary schools, and what we want uh, to do in the next couple slides is just remind you of the enrollment conversations we've had over the course of the last six to nine months. Uh, this is uh, out of uh, US, uh, US DOE data sets. And what they're predicting by 2030 is throughout the United States, a 2.8 million student decrease. We are also know that of the 100 largest school districts in the nation, 85 of those school districts are in declining enrollment mode. The, you know, the reason that uh, school districts are declining are primarily due to birth rates and fertility rates throughout the nation being low. And then housing costs in certain communities being high and that the housing costs being high, driving young families out to where they can have affordable housing is another critical factor in a variety of school districts throughout the nation where housing co costs in urban areas continue to increase. So we do know this is the national trend. Keep going, next slide. And here's a map of the national trend. Both those pr previous slides are off uh, articles throughout the nation, and what you can see here is throughout the nation, the vast majority of school districts in the nation are expected to either remain constant in enrollment or decline in enrollment marked by grays and reds. Keep going. And here's what we're predicted to do uh, by, based on some of our models. And we run a variety of different models in this district um, based on certain, diff uh, certain types of cohort retention uh, and generation rates of, of housing units and apartment units, multifamily, single family. And what we know is we think we're going to decline enrollment next year by about 1,000 students. Please be re remember and recall that our 12th grade population that's graduating is about 800 students in our incoming kindergarten class. So just on that alone, we know we're going to decline uh, by about 800 students, let alone the birth rate conversation and uh, the housing cost conversation. And uh, also please note that in 2033, we think we, we will be around 50,000 students in this district. Next slide. But, but... I uh, know a couple things about demographic projections. First of all, there's a margin of error in the short term. Uh, we can model several different ways. In fact, last year we had a model showing that we were going to decline by 100 students. We had another model showing that we were going to decline by 1,600 students. Uh, and then we built into the bu budget a model that was moderately in between. And you see how the year plays itself out. The whole point being there is a margin of error in short-term calculations. And then the other note in demography, and any good demographer from applied economics to Davis demography to in-house demography will tell you this, the further the time frame, the larger the variance. Uh, and and uh, so the further you forecast out, the more likely you are to miss by a wider range. So when I say we, we think we might be at 50,000 students in 2033, I am a lot less confident in that number 
than the intermediate number of next year, if that makes sense to you. Preschool enrollment's not included, by the way, in that previous slide, so you got to add 2,000 more students. Well, we're actually over 2,000 students in preschool, so in the previous slide, you got to add about 2,000 students to every yellow and blue bar. Uh, uh, charter school enrollment is assumed to be constant at 20 to 25 percent in Arizona. That's because charter school growth in Arizona is not is not happening uh, uh, at the rate that it is throughout the nation because of the fact that we were early implementers of charter schools dating back to 1994. Uh, so uh, our big boom in the charter school market happened in, in the 1990s and 2000s. And last year, actually, throughout the state of Arizona, charter school enrollment went down by 0.3% if you look at the Arizona Department of Education data. And then birthing rates and dwelling rates uh, are, are assumed to be uh, the same. And, and what that means is we look at prior generation rates and we model those out to be pretty similar to prior years. Uh, with a little factor for decline in those. Uh, so the thing I like to bring up with this is if there's an incident that occurs, uh, like, for instance, the state legislature implements a law that affects a certain population of people and they migrate or move to another place, we can't model out that, right? So if those situations happen, then they happen, and we got to adjust our models after the fact because I can't predict what's going to happen at the state legislature level. Or a major business move, that's another one that, that happened in Chandler once, a major business moves, and all of a sudden you have, you know, uh, 2,000 families moving, and that's hard to predict that, a, you know, that a business is going to up and close its doors uh, within a quick time period, and you got to adjust your demographic models. Keep going. So uh, another couple things here. We, we know uh, that growth happens in square miles. So the big idea on this slide is one section is about 640 acres, one square mile of land, 640 acres at a typical, typical dwelling per acre uh, generation is about 1,500 homes. And 1,500 homes when you're generating about a half a kid per home is about 750 students. So you see a square mile or two square miles go up and you need an extra elementary school. You'd see eight square miles get developed and you'd need a junior high. You'd see 16 square miles go up and you'd need a high school. Keep going, next slide. But what we know about declining enrollment is that declining enrollment happens across square miles. And declining enrollment happening across square miles is demonstrated by that table here from last year to this year. You have Kerr Elementary who did not regenerate as many students as it had last year and therefore it had a student enrollment decline of 28 students. Doesn't mean they lost students. Doesn't mean uh, that all of a sudden students chose a different option. It means that they're typically their kindergarten and backfill rate for kids that move out of the community is not matching uh, uh, what it was in the prior year. So at Kerr, you see they lost about one FTE. Then you go down to uh, Whitman Elementary, and I think that's 14 students that they're below last year's FTE account, which is about a half FTE. And then Washington Elementary, 11 students. The real big point of that table is declining enrollment doesn't happen within a square mile. It happens across square miles. It's not like you're losing a whole square mile and say, that's the elementary school that needs to be repurposed or find a second life because you're slowly losing students across the whole uh, square, 200 square miles of the district. And once again, it's not losing students. It's just the replacement rate of students is not matching the outflow of students at the 12th grade, 12th grade level. So keep going down. And the way we like to graphically kind of uh, uh, visualize this is this. This is a great graphics representation. And once again, uh, uh, <laughs> example of how great Mesa Public Schools is. We have uh, a couple departments that help with graphic design. And they came up with this great visualization where growth happens within a square mile and uh, declining enrollment happens across square miles. And so uh, we need to keep reiterating that, that it's not we emptied out one elementary school it's several elementary schools who have declining enrollment of 10 15 students and that adds up across a large school district next slide uh with declining enrollment due to demographic changes including birth rates and housing costs what are the barriers that the governing board members anticipate amongst stakeholders so these modules are designed to ask you questions along the way so we can get feedback so short little five to ten minute presentations and then feedback from you guys Thank you, Dr. Strom. Do the board members have any questions, comments, concerns? Dr. O'Reilly? Could you rephrase that question a little Thank bit? I mean, what are you, what are you Thank asking? Thank you. What are you asking? Know, I'm not quite certain. <laughs> yeah, I guess we, we, know, we know that we're going to be in declining enrollment uh, probably for the next 10 years. 
So what are the big level barriers that you see as we're in declining enrollment for the next 10 years? Now, I do want to give you a little, little hope. We know last year to this year, birth rates are increasing slightly, but it's, it's not that fertility rates are going from 55, which is what they're, depending on what national level metric you look at for the city of Mesa, it's not like they're going from 55 back to 77 like they were a decade ago. Mm -hmm. They're going from 55 births per 1,000 women of childbearing age to 57 births of women of childbearing age. So a uh, little hope in that is that birth rates we think are going to uh, increase. But this big question is we know we're going to be in declining enrollment due to these demographic issues for probably the next decade. And the question is what barriers do you see for the school district? What challenges do you see? Uh, yeah. Messieurs, no? I, I have a question, and I'm not sure that you can answer it, but um, I know that we have emphasized um, pre-K programs and have, have, have a, a lot of uh, diversity in the options that we provide in, in pre-K. Um, and if we've got almost 2,000 pre-K kiddos that are not included in our count uh, of, of attendance here at Mesa Public Schools, um, how many of those pre-K kiddos are enrolling in kindergarten? Our goal this year is to have at least 80% of those retained. The reason it's 80 is because that would be an increase over the prior year. We typically run in the 70 to 80% range. So we're hoping our principals can beat the metric that we've, uh, that we've the, our best ever year and at, at least 80% capture rate out of those preschool kids. We would have one of our better, uh, our, our best uh, year of capture amongst preschool kids. Okay, because I, I know that we, we felt that if we invested in pre-K and, and providing many different options, that that could provide a benefit in that once people get a taste of Mace Public Schools, they're going to stay. And so I'm hoping that that's what, what we're seeing, and, and you just affirmed that. That's, that's terrific. And 80% of a larger number. Yeah, right, exactly, exactly, terrific. Okay. Any other questions, Ms. Sears? I was trying to see if my question is uh, down um, the line because you're actually asking us to give you um, some um, directive. But I would like to see, and this is more work, unfortunately, uh, Dr. Forlis, like an opportunity for maybe um, the governing board to have um, just every time I look at uh, Associate uh, Superintendent Holly, I'm just thinking about how we thought about going for what people and what the appetite was. And we're talking about doing a reconvening, but I think um, I as a board member, and it would be interesting for us to, in segmented parts, to actually, so we have agri-science going on, we have Franklin's going on, Apple, STEM, actually um, have um, an anal analysis mm -hmm. of what's actually going on in the district, because it's a lot and we know that we have some areas very successful we have de depending on what people's appetite is we have a whole lot and i think we start with that before going out to the public and again and saying what do you want and then you know everybody do their wish list and all of that because we do know that we're going to get some wish list items some things we're going to be able to address, but first we've already asked the public some things, and I think it's important for this board that exists today to have a more comprehensive idea. And when we think about performance of kids and what the public's asking and the demand and where the demand is, we reassess that. I know we've done some things in terms of the Montessori's and different things like that, but I think it's time that we look at the data and also organize things where we have a session just around that because we are such a large district before we kind of say, okay, here we are back in the public and everybody just kind of come and give us feedback on everything that we have. Because I think we will look, we'll see a lot of different things because the pandemic did have a tremendous effect on the district. So with it's about best use of what we have. And I keep hearing that over and over and repurposing, but it's awareness and operation. And then looking at that in the face of student outcomes mm -hmm. and where um, we are, 
we have uh, resources coming in, we can actually think about that allocation and then have that grasp before we go out to the public again. I think that would be very important because it's Sears, been you are a long time. Beautifully forecasting one of our another an upcoming module that we have, but I've got the note down to. Um, provide an analysis of where our programs are and how well they perform and geographically where are they located. So we'll make sure to bring that to you. Any other comments or concerns? Yeah, I have a question. So with the declining enrollment, I, I appreciate that, you know, I understand it's happening all over, like enrollment declines are everywhere, but we do have over a thousand students that join the ESA and the ESA program where it expanded to private and homeschools relatively new so we did have students lose there but when I see these enrollment declines are everywhere that started happening when we had school from home and a lot of parents saw what was going on in the classrooms and they didn't like what was going on in the classrooms and I feel like we avoid having that discussion because we talk about okay well the demographics are changing but there are parents that have left over ideological issues that they're seeing in the classroom and we just had the MEA send out a letter saying we're going to teach unapproved curriculum in February because that's what we want to do and, and sent out resources for debunked academic curriculum. When are we going to address those issues that are making some families flee the district? It's not just demographics. The, the instruction, what happens at school, has some, has some uh, impact on people leaving the district. So, Ms. Walden, I appreciate the question. A couple, a couple things that we know from the data, and I can send you on the research from Learning Policy Institute. Uh, they just came out with a report uh, on who in the ESA programs are actually taking advantage of ESAs. And what we know is 75% of the kids in Arizona that are taking advantage of ESAs are actually kids that were not public school. The new, the new kids are actually kids that not, aren't even public school kids. They're kids that are private school kids that when the voucher came out, they said, oh, I'll take the voucher too. And that's why the legislature uh, is running bills right now that are capping, pri that are attempting to, they, have, they haven't been passed yet, mm -hmm. but are attempting to attack, attack private school tuition hikes. And w what I mean by that is the private schools know the parents now have the $7,000, $8,000 voucher, whatever the value is to that family, right? And they were paying $14,000 in tuition to go to private school X. So guess what? We're going to go ahead and raise our tuition to 22000 because the parents have already demonstrated they can afford 14000 and we know they're getting the $8,000 ESA. And so what we know about ESAs in Mesa is, yes, I'm not going to sit here and tell you we lost no kids due to ESAs. That would not be correct. But we know that we have data from a state level where 75% of the kids that took advantage, new kids that took advantage of ESAs are from private schools, not from public schools. Mm -hmm. We think that, that that idea plays out in Mesa public schools. Further, we know we're capturing ESA students at Eagle Ridge. So some of those thousand students that you're saying Mesa Public Schools increase because that's public data that, that the AD published. Some of those thousand students are the kids that were already at private schools that are getting vouchers. We think that's around 750 of them. Then we think an additional big portion of the amount of the 250 remaining are kids that are actually coming to us for, uh, at Eagle Ridge for services because our Eagle Ridge population is up by a little over 100 kids this year. So uh, we, we, we think that kind of marries with that data and that story, but uh, in terms of ad addressing what we can do to ensure all parents in this district across a variety of different backgrounds are okay with the curriculum, curriculum offerings that we have in this district is we need to continue to work to communicate to make sure that all parents understand our curriculum offerings, understanding the 60-day review that our curriculum's gotta go through and understand the supplementary uh, curriculum review that our curriculum's got to go through in order to be a governing board approved curriculum in Mesa Public Schools. And we'll, we'll continue to make efforts to make sure the community understands and trusts our ability to deliver on our promise and our portrait of our graduate. And I think that the district does. Like, I know we have a curriculum center that I've you know visited and, and we have a process, but I'm talking about how many times when they go off curriculum and we're introducing material that's not approved and, and those are where I'm finding complaints or where, you know, as a board member, I get emails about something in the classroom or something yeah. on the, on the, on the uh, syllabus or something, but that's not approved curriculum. And I think those are a lot of things that parents saw 
And that's where we've seen declines across the country. And, and there's tons and tons of stories about that, about things being taught that that aren't appropriate. So, I'll, I mean, I'm digressing. I don't yeah. want to waste time because I know we're limited on time, but that's just something I want us to, to think about and how we're going to address that when, uh, when we have classroom situations where they're going off on unapproved curriculum. Ms. Well, two little comments before we get back uh, on, on, on track here. One is your, uh, the governing board's currently going through policy reviews and revisions, and every district I've ever been in has a process in place via their policy provisions that when curriculum elements like that come up that the community member can file uh, a procedural uh, filing with the right appropriate people in the district so we can review that circumstance and I want the community here we have those have always had those in Mesa policy and I don't think this board's going to approve policy without those going forward so please know there are there are tools where if you're a community member concerned about those things you can certainly file and we will do our due diligence as required by board policy to investigate those situations. The other thing I want you to know is nationally, I, 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 I understand the, some of the comments in that, you know, there is a charter school movement happening in the state of Iowa right now. There is a charter school movement happening in other states right now. And for the school, the states that haven't had the charter school influx that we had in the 90s and 2000s, I'm not gonna sit here and disagree with you that some parents are probably walking with their feet. That's not necessarily how it translates to Arizona because that happened in the 90s and the 2000s. So just honoring the conversation back and forth with you. Thank you. Yep. Dr. O'Reilly. Um, I, I did go through some training from uh, Georgetown University and they, they talked about, one of the things they talked about was losing students. And they said they warned districts to, be con to not focus so much on trying to get students back because you're not going to get them back, people don't get those students back. So I just want to think it's important we focus on our current students and families and serve them well rather than putting an inordinate amount, you know, not, I'm not saying do no effort, but an inordinate amount of effort on recruiting students who aren't currently enrolled. And I think by focusing on our current students and parents and meeting their needs and providing what they need, that will probably more be more beneficial over the long term as we look at these projections than trying to get people back that we probably won't get back. And what the folks at Georgetown said was the districts that focus on getting people back and not the other, you know, how well they're doing mm -hmm. and adjusting to the realities, they're in much worse shape over time because they didn't respond when they could have. So, so that's my comment on that. Great point. Thank you very much. Okay, module three, please. Uh, in module three, we want to talk about smaller schools and smaller school advantages. Uh, we've, we've done quite a bit of research, uh, going to virtual conferences, uh, meeting and viewing virtual webinars. Uh, th this idea is out of ERS. They're a company that helps school districts throughout the nation. And what they're going to tell you is that most school districts, as they get smaller, the mistake they make is that the small schools just kind of happen and then all of a sudden they're running with small schools. And what their thought is, is if you put purposeful redesign into how school, small schools run and are optimized and function, you can end up in a much better spot with a better portfolio of schools through a design-centered process. And so that's what we wanna kind of show you in these next slides is, hey, we can approach small schools. And what we're talking about in small schools, primarily out of the gate in Mesa Public Schools is smaller elementary schools. And we can approach this smaller elementary school process with a very thoughtful idea so that we don't just end up with a school of 250 and we didn't plan for it, or we don't end up with a school of 325 and we didn't plan for it. And so uh, through the design center process, we think we can have a really great portfolio of schools uh, as we continue to grow Mesa Public Schools for this next decade. Keep going. And, and so we know in this slide, and this is not exhaustive at all, we know that small schools offer some you know, things that are aligned with our promise. And we know that at small schools, we need to consider some questions along the way. For example, aligned with our promise, when you're running smaller schools, it's probably a little bit more likely that you're gonna know as the administrative assistant or as the administrator, you're gonna probably know every student by name. It makes it more viable for that to happen. Uh, we also think that we might be able to get to student level deeper and personalized learning in an in a easier fashion aligned with making sure kids are college and career and community ready. Uh, for the programs we're going to offer and the pathways we're going to offer at the secondary level as well. Uh, some questions going through our, our mind is, you know, when you run smaller schools, you, you sometimes don't 
have as many resources to provide intervention and, enri and enrichment activities. And so how do we function in a district of our size where we can maybe centralize some of those opportunities uh, to help small schools out along the way? The big idea here is we know as we're entering into this next decade of Mesa Public Schools that if we're gonna run small schools and thoughtfully design them, we're gonna have to look at every opportunity to live into our promise and also look at every question to see if we can answer it in a, in a financially uh, 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 optimized way. Keep going. So uh, one thing to note here is we've learned from a variety of different school districts all the way from Jeffco in Colorado uh, to our some fellow East Valley school districts and uh, what we've learned is it's not really optimal to tell you that at this school size it's you know we we think we should look at the second life of a school look at repurposing the school the, the real big idea is uh, every school size is complex and context dependent and you need to consider that right running Serine Montessori and Dr. Forlis brings this up all the time, where we grade level team across grade levels because the grades are banded together, you can run a smaller school in that fashion. And if you understand the context that it's a Montessori and the context that teachers know their standards at the K-1-2 level and then can intervene as they're doing learning activities in both individual uh, lessons, small group lessons, and some minor whole group lessons. If you understand that context, you can understand that me telling you the school's running at 375 kids doesn't mean a whole lot, right? It's complex and context dependent. Similarly, at a large high school, right? I can tell you the high school's running at 4,100 kids, Hamilton High School. But until I tell you the context, right, that Hamilton's got 152 different extracurricular clubs, that it's got 26 different uh, uh, athletic clubs that kids belong to, and I start providing some of that context to dial in how you get a sense of belonging with students on that campus, right? Until we give you that context, we don't really know what's happening at the school. And so uh, I, I, this, the whole point of this slide, slide is that there's possible advantages and possible challenges to plan for as you're running small schools. But to give you a number and say to you, this is where we wanna talk about the second life and repurposing a school is kind of a fruitless activity and we've learned that from others. I need you to know that we've learned that from other school districts. We have extensive conversations with other school districts that have said to us, the one mistake we've made is we put a number on it. And the second we put a number on it, the community says, oh, you told us that number and we went below it. Well, in a context dependent, complex situation like Serine, it may make sense to run that smaller school as long as we can run it financially in a financially optimized situation. Next slide. But the key question for us uh, and we came up to, with this question as a team. At what point does educational programming, including elective and extracurricular off, curricular offerings, get negatively impacted to the degree that it becomes extremely difficult for a school site to live into our promise and portrait? So it's not a number, right? It's about answering that question, right? If we can't do that at that school site, right, because it's probably smaller, right, not a number, but probably smaller, then we know we have an issue. And so that's our critical question in Mesa Public Schools. So key points, smaller schools have advantages and disadvantages. We're gonna look at some efficiencies in module four. And one of the questions, uh, small schools uh, can, can, can exist, but you need to understand that we, we need to probably be less prescriptive with staffing. And we're gonna talk about that in module four if we're gonna run small schools. And what is the educational mission of the district? And at what point does a small school become too small to live into this is the idea behind uh, how we're gonna measure whether we need to talk about repurposing or the second life of a school. Keep going. Reflection question. What contingency plans do board members anticipate needing to address unforeseen challenges or changes in circumstances to operating smaller schools? So the idea here is, do you, do you need any contingency plans? Uh, you know, we've talked a little bit about uh, uh, what a small school might be able to do, but we know that there's unforeseen challenges that come about and changes in circumstances that come about. So do you need any other elements, contingency plans centered around small schools after hearing uh, this first part of the conversation? Board Member Sears. And um, yeah, I I'm writing some questions down because I think there's some uh, things we I would like to take a little time to 
um, tinker out. But one of the things that um, we learned with COVID, uh, you know, it's the first time happenstance, is as we moved people uh, around the district and we put people together and did different things at different sites, there was a whole lot of learning in that. And this is not COVID, but I think um, to what we talked about earlier is adding some of that contextual information. And I think that goes in the whole scale of how we are looking at employment when we are um, working with our employees. So I think I would like to also have in that context where I was talking about what we have in our district, some positive ahas and learnings that we have. And I'm, again, uh, looking to you when, when I looked at the like furniture and you know what we learned in those furniture things. I think there's a lot of this information that's harnessed in the um, mind of the leaders here that we may not have to contextualize in as we think of these things. Because as we look at a contingency of um, anticipated challenges, I think the great challenge of COVID gave us some things now that we can actually use some of those learning and tools in. So I would um, think that some of the thought leaders around here could actually contribute some of those things as we look at the smaller schools and operating. Because we had where we had people at home, we had people in there, and we're like, okay, we're making a gymnasium to accommodate X, Y, and Z children, but we had to just wait to see who showed up and then adjust again. So I think there was a lot of learning in that that we could actually contextualize in this. Not exactly the same thing, but uh, just, like I said, uh, applying to. So that's how I've been really thinking about the smaller schools and really the valuable lessons we learned in COVID. Thank you. Any other board members? Yes, Dr. O'Reilly. Uh, two things. One is, this sounds you know, unforeseen challenges and it sounds all negative, but it may be an opportunity. So I think we have to look at it that way as, what is it giving us that we, we haven't had when we had 1,100 kids in an elementary school that now you have 350? And, and so I, I want to make sure we look at it both ways. And the other thing, as I think about this, I think we need flexibility in decision making. So um, a great configuration makes sense for Ishikawa and Stapley, for example. Um, you know, maybe it, that would work if you could share space. But Emerson and Carson, which are also right next to each other, that may not work. So, uh, you know, given they're right next door, some things work in one place but not another. Uh, maybe there's not a place next door. So. I just want to make sure our contingency plans are flexible and think about, as you said, the context dependent. Mm -hmm. That's, that is something that I think we need to uh, very much keep in mind and not just say, okay, this is, this is what we, if X happens, this is what we're going to do. We're going to do Y when that works in one place, but not another. Thank you, Dr. O'Reilly. Ms. Davis. Yes, I just was wondering, as far as if we go to smaller schools, thinking about transportation, like we have some schools that don't have any transportation um, issues, but if we're mixing kids between going to other schools, is that another, you know, problem we'll foresee? That can be, um, you have to think of that two, two different ways, um, because closing a school would also create transportation issues. So it may be the lesser of the options. So, but they, it, it, thank you for bringing up transportation because it is one of the more complicated issues. And a lot of folks say, well, if you close a school, you're going to save money and you're going to save money on transportation. No, you're probably going to cost more to transport students because now students that used to walk to school are being bused. And as you said, if we start crossing K, you know, threes and fours and sixes, and that, that's something that we'd have to look at a routing pr procedure. It might be more efficient. It might be equal. It might be a little more costly, but we might find savings somewhere else. So those, those are the things we'd have to look at. Dr. Riley, I'm really glad you talked about it might be an opportunity because I think about how we are developing community partnerships. And when I see the red shirts of Honeywell 
in our school. And I'm, I think, you know, we have community partnerships, we have businesses, nonprofits, um, we have agencies and institutions that want to be involved in our schools. And this might provide an opportunity because we'll, we would have the space in a smaller school. And, and I'd really like to um, see it as an opportunity for the community to be involved. When you're, when you're built to the rafters and you've got, you're using every available space, you can't invite the community in, 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 and create programming where the community could share in the responsibility. And I, I just believe that whether it be health services or workforce development, whatever it might be, the community does want to help and we would have the space. And I think we should not lose sight of the opportunities that it provides. So I, I really appreciate your comment on that. I think that's really important. My last comment kind of to what I was saying earlier. So I appreciate the opportunity to actually see what we have. And my reflective thought as I'm looking at reflection is taking a step back at the um, former success and the innovation that was um, seen now as just the norm and the typical, this is what we have. Like how we got to the place of having the Montessori's. How do we get the Apple schools very much, like you said, the partnerships and all these things that came to be. And as um, we do that, then I think that will inform a little bit how we um, go forward and even proceed in how we talk to our community because all of those things were community efforts. Like, you know, mm -hmm. I remember being in the Wilson neighborhood, bought a new house in the Wilson neighborhood and decided, oh, I want to be a part of these parents who go all the way to Viorio Johnson to um, put my kids in Montessori. So I think that thing we keep and hold dear, that that was very much community led and, you know, even have that backstory in context as we go forward to looking at, you know, these, the, if that means, you know, repurposing and all of that, we don't just think about, okay, going forward with the community needs, whatever, but everything we have and what we've done, we started with a premise and not just a premise, but an actionable goal of parents getting together and saying, these are the needs that we have. And we have all of these things that exist because they were called on, they were, the community called on us to provide these particular spaces. Okay, thank you very much for all your input. Um, I think we're ready for module four. I think I'm the uh, bridge to, into module uh, number four. Oh, no, I'm... Yes, you are. Yes, I am. I clicked ahead on my own uh, slide right here. We talked about um, six different modules that we're going to work through, and within those six modules are four strategies. And so I want to talk you through these four strategies. The first one is a focus on reducing our portables. A second is developing regions of choice. A third is unique school and staffing models. And then strategy four is school repurpose or closure. And it would be our recommendation that we work through strategies one, two, and three before we would consider strategy four. So with that big idea, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Mr. Thompson. Thank you, Dr. Forlis. So we're going to do this by the numbers, um, really, this part. Um, the district uh, was very foresighted and probably somewhat forced uh, in the age of growth to consider the use of portables um, before schools could be built. I know campuses of portables in Mesa were built up. Kids arrived, kids were educated, buildings got built portables were moved on. Uh, we're on the other side of that now. And as Dr. Strom pointed out this morning to everyone, that was foresighted because these are the type of facilities that should be temporary. And so now the temper we're on the side of the temporary going away. So this is not a new conversation for us. Uh, next slide, please. Back in about 2011, 12, I was not here, but I understand the district took on this conversation. Uh, we had a lot more students then. Um, we've been reducing and one of the conversations we heard um, during the election was kind of an idea around the we have lost students uh, we've declined as we've been presented demographically 
but we must have enough stuff because we used to be bigger and now we're smaller. Well, I think in the portable perspective, the answer is absolutely yes, and it's time for us to get very serious uh, about addressing uh, these facilities. Um, as you can see here, I think the most telling number here is 11 elementary schools worth of portables at the elementary level. That's a lot of classrooms, guys. <laughs> And uh, they're getting used for, for, for some very unique things and sometimes for very important things. Um, but it's really time to uh, right size, if you want to use those words, or get serious about how we're going to address the continuing uh, amount of portables within the district. Next slide, please. So as we looked at this, and uh, I want to thank Dr. Strom for really uh, doing the yeoman's work on the math here of how many of the schools in capacity and size are really ready for their portables to uh, be reduced or be removed completely? And so we kind of have the red, yellow, green here where we're going from 40 schools that have 121 portables that really could probably be moved off the campus today. I would say most of our elementaries in general, we have a varying degree of, of different styles and, and construction over the years, but Five to 600 would be their max as a brick and mortar school. Uh, and then they might have three or four portables on them. So if they're at 400 kids, uh, do we need to have those portables on those campuses anymore? And then you go to the yellow where there's still a continuing pro opportunity there of about 10 campuses, uh, 17 that are on the cusp, uh, and then four that probably could use some help with some space. And maybe we want to consider brick and mortar bond funds before we uh, would try to put more portables on those campuses. Uh, we've learned, and I've said for many years, moving portables and placing them on campuses is expensive, time consuming, and often doesn't really result in the outcomes you're looking for. Next slide, please. So what does it look like from a cost? And, and I can say these are real costs, guys, because we actually tracked for over a year the direct utilities on a portable. We wanted to see what the electrical costs were. were. Those are, they're uh, less insulated, uh, typically run a little, uh, little heavier on the AC. So um, that 10,000 10, a year is, is a very real number that we, we have measured. Uh, then cleaning costs and maintenance costs, you're looking just short of about $15,000 a year just to have two classrooms, basically. So that's, you know, typically these are two classroom units at 1,800 square feet. Next slide. So if you add that to the uh, numbers we showed you earlier, you're looking at just short of a $2 million savings annually for those that are in the red, uh, and then another million possibly for those um, that are in the green um, so, you know, there, there's well over $3 million in potential savings uh, by reducing our use of these types of facilities. Next slide, please. So that's the portable conversation, and then we go to strategy two. Strategy two is uh, regions of choice. Next slide. So what do we know about school choice? Uh, we know convenience matters. And proximity matters. Um, close to their home, transportation options that make it convenient, make parents more likely to take advantage of school choice. Um, primarily due to freeway systems, uh, MPS has a lower rate of capture from students outside uh, the district. Um, for example, I'll give you an example here. Uh, in a district where the traffic flow goes through the district to get to a major freeway, they might attract 20 to 25% of their kids from outside the district boundaries, another school district. In a district where people go around the school district, uh, like Mesa Public Schools, and I know the 202 goes right up through the top portion of our district, but people don't get off the freeway on their way to work typically, if that makes sense to you. So you imagine that 202 going around the north side and that 60 coming around our south side, we have less arterial traffic uh, than a lot of school districts in the Southeast Valley, like Chandler, Queen, Queen Creek, and J.O. Combs. So uh, freeway systems have put us in a position where we don't draw from out of district at the rate that some other districts draw at. Um, but we do know that we have a typical market capture rate. By the way, those previous two 
uh, points are all in Arizona Department of Education data sets that were just published this last year. So if anyone on the board wants to come and comb through those data sets with me, I'll show you exactly where we get these inferences. Uh, we have a typical market capture share rate of around 75%. The highest East Valley district in market capture is around 78% based on that ADE data. So about three out of every four kids that live in Mesa Public Schools choose Mesa Public Schools. And the highest district, once again, is at about 78%. So we know internally to our district, we're attracting at a pretty typical market rate. Uh, but we know that the issue is when uh, students within the district are choosing other schooling options, we don't replace with out-of-district kids near as much, and that's because people travel around our district to get to school as opposed to going through our district uh, to get to school. Um, but convenience matters is the big point of this slide. Next slide. Uh, and so what we have right now is we have two in each region. Think of the west region, the central region, and the east region. We have two large comprehensive high schools. On the west side, that's Westwood Dobson. On the central region, that's Mountain View Mesa. And on the east side, that's Red Mountain and Skyline. We have about three to four large comprehensive junior highs and about eight to 25 medium-sized elementary schools. And what we want to do is over the next decade, we want to understand that location and proximity matters and that in these regions, we want to see every region have a Franklin option. So the East region have a Franklin option, the Central region have a Franklin option, and the West region have a Franklin option. We wanna see a STEM academy in every region. We wanna see an arts academy in every region, a dual language, a DLI program in every region. And then the next one is we wanna see one small high school option. There is, a, there is a market for small high school options and most districts have moved to running these smaller high schools typically between four to 800 students. That's a cohort size, ninth grade cohort, ninth grade, 10th grade, 11th grade, 12th grade of about 100 to 200 kids in a, in a class. I will tell you to execute this option over the next decade, it is gonna take remodeling and re-envisioning some of our schools, which is gonna take capital investments on behalf of our, our uh, uh, local taxpayers. Um, so we're gonna have to figure out how to tell local taxpayers the story so that they can understand what we're trying to do in Mesa Public Schools to provide options that are proximally located and convenient for those families. Next slide. Uh, Dr. Mallerwine and his team are working through the process of setting up pathways, so I think these are better served by him talking about it. Madam President, mem members of the governing board, um, we went through this, this our pathways of, um, a while ago, and nothing has really changed. What we're, what we're looking at is we're looking at implementing some career exploration in our junior highs so our students can start getting an idea of what, what, what there can be after high school in, in regards to um, high wage, high career jobs, and you know, career opportunities. Then when our kids, our, our students move through from junior high, they'll move into our ninth grade teaming model, which we've talked quite a bit about. During that teaming model, they're gonna get um, a lot of really intensive career exploration, surveying, um, different type of experiences. We're gonna curate opportunities for them to experience a number of different um, opportunities to learn about different careers. And then we are in the process right now of creating um, the different academies that will exist at our high schools. Uh, we have student design teams, teacher design teams led by administration that are that are gonna make these community and site specific. And we will bring that to you when those are ready. So th that in summation quickly, that's what this slide um, kind of uh, represents. And then this all is a, has a culminating effect uh, in about 16 to 18 months to begin the 25, 26 school year when we will be looking at wall-to-wall -wall teaming models in our grades seven, eight, and nine. Um, we've talked about the teaming model bringing a heightened sense of belonging and connection with, with, with um, other students and adults at school. We know that's critical to keep our kids in Mesa schools and we know that grades seven, eight, and nine are pretty critical years. So that we, that's a big reason for that. And then those pathways will be, um, will come to fruition They'll be kind of um, identified by school and launched to the start of that school year at our with our junior highs, building some continuity with our high schools. And then again, the um, superintendent Forlis's goal of having 50% of our Mesa schools 
having some sort of our teaming. We are already there, and we are continuing to build on that. So that will be our, a real marker for where we want to be to begin the 25-26 school year. Thank you. And, and to marry that with regions, regions of choice, if we get these pathways right and across our high schools, uh, or when we get these pathways right and across our high schools, we have – Eight, eight to ten pathways, then we can start envisioning how to arti articulate this backwards, design it backwards, and start to see these kids move up through our K-8 systems nicely into this system that uh, secondary education is designing. Uh, strategy three is unique school staffing models. Um, what we know about small schools and staffing efficiencies, small schools are fee feasible. Uh, we just need guardrails established. Um, and, and we need to be able to understand how those guardrails interact with the variety of constructs that Mesa Public Schools already has. And we'll cover that in this portion of this presentation here. Uh, fixed costs of staffing absorb more revenue generation of a school as a school becomes smaller. So how you deal with the fixed costs, what are your fixed costs? Custodial staffing, front office staffing, administrative staffing. You're going to have to look uniquely at how you uh, manage those fixed costs as school, schools become smaller. But once again, you can run small schools. You just have to look at the fixed costs and understand how they're affecting the revenue generated at that school. And districts that run small schools must be willing to look at grade level configurations across a combination of schools or within a school. So across schools and within a school, you have to envision looking at grade level configurations. I will tell you, uh, from a small county in Iowa, right, little Adair County, my mom went to a one, one room schoolhouse, right, one room schoolhouse in Orient, Iowa, and the, my grandpa later bought the schoolhouse, and guess what, that's where he farmed pigs at, right, and so the, the, the fact of the matter is, the reason I'm bringing it up is, that small school worked, it worked, but you had to look at staffing differently, right, you had to look at fixed costs of the staffing differently, and so uh, you can make them work, you're just going to have to look at your grade level configurations and how you run them. Uh, this very first one here, is a diagram that explains how you can look at K3 and 4-6 grading options. And I think from here we'll let Mr. Wing take it off. In this example, good evening. Is that working okay? Uh, in this example, you, you may have two K6 uh, schools close in proximity, um, small schools where you can consider one being a K3 school, one being a 4-6 school. We look at economies of scale. Let's use uh, first grade, for example. <clears throat> if you have 34 students in one school, uh, pretty high to have 34 in one classroom. So you have two first grade teachers, 34 in the other school. But if you combine and have 68 students, you would have three teachers instead of the four combined by having two small schools as an example. Next slide. Um, I already provided the, the example on the grade level configuration. I know there are other grade level configurations. Dr. Strom shared 712 K8 as an example as well. Multi-grade models, looking at our staff staffing uh, models. Uh, we've shared that Sarai Montessori, for example, has pre-K to K teams, uh, first and second grade teams, and how does that staffing uh, look in our small schools? What we know as far as uh, funding methods at our schools, Auditor General Report shares with us how we spend our dollars in the blue are somewhat of our fixed cost operations being at 10%, for example, transportation, food service, administration at 7.9, one of the lowest in the state. Administration does not mean just administrators, it's our payroll staff, our school office staff, et cetera. And then in the green, about 72, 73%, our instructional support uh, those uh, impacting our instructions and student support. So with that blue, for for example, every dollar we receive for a student in revenue, approximately 26% are applied to operations, transportation, food, food service, et cetera. The other uh, 74 to 75% are for the instructional-based uh, programs. So... In this case of 300 students, we receive over $2 million in revenue, taking 70, 73%, whatever, of those funds, applying it to the school staffing, about $1.47 million. Perhaps you have a principal, 12 teachers, uh, three office staff, 
three part-time staff. You've spent that $1.47 million on that staff. So next slide. Yep. Dr. Riley. So, so just so I understand, so are you saying it's it's $1,493,000 for those staff, and that's the staff you would need at that school? That's based on the revenue we receive and portion out that those dollars to the fixed cost versus what we can provide to that school of 300 students. So it's so based on our current it. based on our current staffing models. The next slide will show us and have us explore. Do we reconsider how we staff schools? Okay, and is the 1.4 million 470 thousand? Is that it's just approximate number, so it that's doesn't not have to be including the staff, or is it including the staff? I'm just trying to understand that, these doc, two numbers. Dr. 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 Raleigh, that is a uh, school of 300 students would generate over two million dollars. After you subtract out the fixed cost of operations, transportation, you're left with about 1.47 million dollars. Okay, and what we're saying here is one unique way to staff, right, with school sites is to have your business office, HR uh, department and the principal work together to go, okay, we have about $1.47 million, right, to run your school. What do you want to hire, right? What do you need to run successfully? And we've already experimented this a little bit in Mesa with NEW, the Next Education Workforce, right? And, and the fact of the matter is you, you could have, just telling you how some schools have done this, you could have one first grade teacher with four instructional assistants. And yeah, that one first grade teacher might have 60 students on their rosters, but now you have five adults working with 60 kids and you're spending approximately the same amount of money as spending with three teachers across those 60 kids. And so there's just unique ways to take the revenue generated at a school and say to the principal, hey, let's work within your revenue and figure out if we can staff your school to fit the needs and live into our promise. Okay, so, so we can live on that amount. So yeah, yeah, yeah. That's so what the, I want the, to understand. The difference, okay. we got asked this question this morning and I did not adjust the slide and I probably should have. But you look there at the $23,000 differential and say, oh, you're overexpending your revenues a little bit. That's one thing that's the blessing of being a large school district. In a large school district, that $23,000 can get absorbed by a school district, by a school that may help you out by not spending as much on their staffing. And so when you're larger, that difference of $23,000 doesn't concern us as much because there will be a school where they underexpend by a little bit of money. Or the $3 also. million that we're saving on portables, or the $8 million Correct. we have in the cell phone tower account. Correct. Things like that. Correct. And so that's an example of how we can staff a school, 300, based on those funds. But the next slide will have us explore uh, unique staff, staffing opportunities. So we take a secondary school, high school, for example, at 3,100 students, we have a ratio of 25 to 1. That high school re receives 124 FTE full-time equivalency, 124 full-time positions. They're able to leverage those positions based on the needs of the uh, 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 school and the students. Current elementary, we staff based on grade level. In this example, 41 students in kindergarten, you receive two teachers. First grade, 44 students, you receive two, two what we could provide is a model similar to the second, uh, secondary where we look at the total number of students, 365. We have the ratio of 25 to 1. Now we have 15 FTE that the principal, human resources, the district uh, reviews and considers how do we want to leverage that staff. So we can look at different staffing models, uh, applying next education workforce, our teaming model, opportunity culture. Uh, if we do the... K three, four, six, do we want two principals or one principal and, and how we leverage our administration, uh, you know, FTE at those sites, things like that. Next slide, please, sorry. You know, some questions we have to ask, are we willing to move outside of the traditional uh, leadership models? Uh, are we gonna share support staff positions across two small schools? Um, are we going to regionalize registration, decentralize our enrollment processes to um, reduce some of our administrative burden, our office uh, burden? Those are some questions we have all allowed. Okay, strategy number four. So as promised, um, as we walk through strategy one, two, and three, which um, 
is going to take time, effort, and, and input to understand what those options are going to look like for us. If all of that's unsuccessful, we get to the possible repurposing or closure of a school. I will share with you two things that are important about this slide. One, we're looking at about a year-long process. Some of this is dictated by statute. Uh, some of this is dictated by our own policy. But you really don't want to take much more than a year to consider school closure. It's not healthy for the community. It's not healthy for uh, the students and the staff that are impacted um, by such a move. The other important part to note here is that School closure does not equal, um, just like that previous slide of maybe two, maybe 300 kids generating $2 million, you do not save $2 million by closing a school. If you close a school, the staff and the students that are, the teaching staff and the students are going to move with. Uh, which, and you're typically still going to have the facility, maybe you rent it, maybe you do something, but unless you're going to tear it down and have an empty lot, which is unlikely, given the cost to do that, you don't generate a lot of savings. We're talking about somewhere in the round of $500,000, $600,000 per school savings in closure. You may even have additional costs, like I mentioned, in transportation, because again, the teaching staff is going to move with the students. So the big cost of any school is teaching staff. That cost remains to the district. It's just not associated with that school anymore. So we want to emphasize this is the last step in trying to utilize all of our facilities as best we can to leverage them for our community. If we get to this point, then this is the process we would use to step through that. Next slide, please. In the interest of time, Scott, let's skip that yep. slide and get to the next one. So, what are MPS's guardrails to repurpose or close a school? Before repurposing, we need to look at the strategies that I just discussed. It, discussed. Um, this is a three to six month community engagement process with a six month, so it's basically a year process. And really what we're looking at is, you know, at the end of the day, to have the real budgetary impact, the question mark is, what would it look like and how many schools would we close? Um, we've seen districts establish a baseline of schools, and that can be problematic, uh, just like establishing a baseline of how many students you have to have to stay open. So all of these conversations are leading to, we understand we have to get to that answer, but we don't have that answer today. And eventually, that answer is going to present itself as we pursue the other um, strategies that we discussed this evening. Okay. So let's keep going to uh, uh, module I, I five think and I'm see gonna, if there's I'm questions. I'm going to suggest something here. Since we, we did get a late start, could I please have folks that are coming in the room be quiet? We're trying to conduct our meeting. Appreciate it. Thank you. Um, would it be possible to stop at this point? Because we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna have a, a meeting, the regular meeting stop at this point, pick this up at our next meeting. It will also give us, I think, the board some time to think particularly about the question on, on, on guardrails and, and, and really give us an opportunity to digest this information. And if, you would, if staff wouldn't mind, I think it would be a good idea to stop at this point so that everybody can get refreshed before the next meeting. Excellent. We will make sure to do that. We will add this on as a discussion item um, or an additional study session topic in an upcoming meeting. I really appreciate the, the work that went into this and want to make sure that we have enough time to really discuss and digest because this is, this is a lot and this is the future of the district that we're taking a look at. Very important information. We need a little bit more time and unfortunately... We didn't get it because our, our, our executive session went long. So appreciate all of you and the work that went into this. This is amazing information. Okay, so at this time, we are going to um, break the study session. 
and we're going to have to adjourn the study session, and then we will reconvene the regular session at 630. So do I have a motion to adjourn the study session? So moved. Ms. Sears has moved. Is there a second? Second. Ms. Davis has seconded. It is moved and seconded to adjourn the study session. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Okay, board members, let's try to be back here at 630. Appreciate you all.
I'd like to call the meeting to order. Welcome to Mesa Public Schools Governing Board meeting and happy Public Schools Week. As a reminder, any citizen who wishes to speak to a consent or action item or call to the public or any of the policy statements must complete the sign-in sheet in the lobby prior to the board's consideration of that agenda item. On our agenda tonight is the Pledge of Allegiance and the presentation of colors as well as our national anthem. The colors and pledge will be presented by the Red Mountain High School Junior ROTC led by Major Olga Cortez and Sergeant First Class Timothy Simmons. Students presenting the colors are Brooklyn Johnson, Elise Bentley, Niza Ferguson, Amelia Day, Hayden Haskey, Jasmine Hale, and Casey Bonera. Our national anthem today is a video performed by the Shepherd Junior High Bel Canto Ensemble directed by Taryn Tidwell. Please stand for the presentation of colors, the pledge, and the national anthem. I pledge allegiance
We'll now review the governing board meeting procedures. Welcome to the Mesa Public Schools Governing Board Meeting. We appreciate your interest in the district. The five elected governing board members serve without compensation and volunteer countless hours. The president and the clerk of the board are elected in January. Under state law, the governing board may only discuss and vote on matters that are on the agenda for tonight's meeting. Agendas are posted a minimum of 24 hours in advance on the Mesa Public Schools website and in the Curriculum Services Center. Copies of tonight's agenda are located in the lobby. The public may speak on any item of business on the agenda that requires the board to take action. If you wish to comment on an action item, please complete a request to address the board form before the item is discussed. The form is located in the lobby. Members of the public will be given a maximum of three minutes to speak. Once recognized by the Governing Board President, please state your name. We ask that all speakers show respect and courtesy to others. During the second regular meeting of each month, the agenda will include a call to the public, which is an opportunity to speak to the Governing Board about a school district matter that is not on the agenda. Please submit a request to address the board form to participate in the call to the public. If you would like the board to consider adding an item to a future agenda, you may submit your request in writing to the board at least five working days before that meeting. The superintendent or governing board president will consider your request. Thank you for your attendance and involvement in tonight's meeting. Mr. Sanders, do we know if we can uh, get that sound up. I think you're trying. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for your patience. We're going to try to get that sound back up. Welcome to the Mesa Public Schools Governing Board meeting. We appreciate your interest in the district. The five elected governing board members serve without compensation and volunteer countless hours. The president and the clerk of the board are elected in January. Under state law, the governing board may only discuss and vote on matters that are on the agenda for tonight's meeting. Agendas are posted a minimum of 24 hours in advance on the Mesa Public Schools website and in the Curriculum Services Center. Copies of tonight's agenda are located in the lobby. The public may speak on any item of business on the agenda that requires the board to take action. If you wish to comment on an action item, please complete a request to address the board form before the item is discussed. The form is located in the lobby. Members of the public will be given a maximum of three minutes to speak. Once recognized by the governing board president, please state your name. We ask that all speakers show respect and courtesy to others. During the second regular meeting of each month, the agenda will include a call to the public which is an opportunity to speak to the governing board about a school district matter that is not on the agenda. Please submit a request to address the board form to participate in the call to the public. If you would like the board to consider adding an item to a future agenda, you may submit your request in writing to the board at least five working days before that meeting. The superintendent or governing board president will consider your request. Thank you for your attendance and involvement in tonight's meeting. This is an official governing board meeting. The board has important business to conduct that is essential to the operation of the district. Everyone is welcome to express ideas or concerns to the board in accordance with the agenda. The poster in the boardroom describes positive behaviors expected and behaviors that cannot be tolerated. Please limit your personal conversations and please no reactive comments for they are disruptive. It is the governing board president's responsibility to maintain proper order so the board can conduct its business in an orderly and efficient manner. If you are disruptive or interfere with the conduct of this meeting, you will be asked to leave so the board can conduct the business of the district.
Consent agenda items are approved with one motion. Dr. O'Reilly, has any citizen requested to speak on a consent agenda item? No, no request to speak on the consent agenda items. Thank you, Dr. O'Reilly. Would a board member like to pull a consent agenda item? S seeing none, thank you very much. It's now time to review the governing board calendar. Dr. Forlis. Thank you very much, Madam President, members of the board. Uh, as we look at our calendar, you will see uh, linked here for you in board docs is uh, the commencement assignments and scripts for that event. So as you are planning your time um, for our upcoming graduations, all the information uh, that you need is right there for you. Uh, our next governing board meeting is March 12th. And that will be starting at 5 o'clock for a study session, um, although we may want to alter that time because we did add an additional agenda item of the um, holdover of our master planning facility study session. So we might need to be flexible with that. 6.30 p.m. will be our regular governing board meeting on March 12th. And then March 28th, through, or I'm sorry, March 18th through the 22nd is spring break. March 18th to the 20th, all of our schools um, are closed and we will have limited district services available. And then March 21st to the 22nd, schools and district offices are closed. So want to make sure that if anybody needs um, anything, any business done over spring break, uh, check a department before you uh, call them first before you drive on down. March 26th is our second governing board meeting of the month of March, beginning at 5 o'clock with a study session and 6.30 with a governing board meeting. And again, as we are looking ahead to October of 2024, that is a five Tuesday month. So we would like to hold governing board meetings on the third uh, Tuesday and the fifth Tuesdays of October. That would be October 15th and October 29th that will allow us to reschedule the meeting that would fall during fall break and have one more consistent schedule of the month rather than meeting close together with those three weeks in between. Uh, this will also be the best time for the annual approved um, annual financial report that we need to do by state statute by October 15th. So if the board would like to have a quick discussion, if we could get a kind of a, a thumbs up around the table to see if October 15th and October 29th would work with your calendars. This is a, a request that administration made of us last time we, we gathered. Is it, is, do we have any problems with rescheduling our governing board meetings in October for October 15th and I'm October 29th. 29th? Got a thumbs up from Ms. Sears, Ms. Walden, Dr. O'Reilly, Ms. Davis, doesn't matter what I think, so here we go. Okay. We, got, we, we, are, we are meeting then on October 15th. 15th and the 29th. 29th. Thank you very much. I know October seems a, a ways away, but before we know it, it will be here. So wanted to make sure that we got that onto your calendars. Thank you so much, Dr. Forless, and thank you, board members, for being flexible. Um, at, next on our agenda is the superintendent's update, and I know we've got a lot to celebrate this week of public schools week. So, Dr. Forlis, would you please provide your update of news and events and celebrations around the district? Absolutely. Chad, we are ready. It is my pleasure to provide an update to you uh, this evening. As, I, as we do every meeting, we always start off with a focus on our strategic goals, all to deliver upon the attitudes and skills of our portrait of a graduate that keeps us um, centered on the work of our students. In Mesa Public Schools, we have a promise to know every one of our students by name, serve them by strength and need so that we graduate, uh, so that they graduate ready for college, career, and community. That is why we exist, and that is um, a commitment. It is our North Star that we drive to deliver on every single day in Mesa Public Schools. So as we think about our promise, I want to, uh, going on to our next slide, there we go, Public Schools Week. Uh, this week marks National Public Schools Week, a time to honor the incredible contributions of our dedicated teachers, staff, administrators, students, and families throughout our district. It is the opportunity to reflect on the vital role of public education in fostering opportunities for all children. February is also Career Technical Education Month. 
We celebrated career and technical education programs for their role in preparing students for high skill, high wage, in demand careers. We tip our hats to the administrators, the teachers, counselors, business partners, parents, students, and stakeholders for their unwavering support in guiding all students towards success. A quick snapshot of what career technical education looks like in Mesa Public Schools. Westwood Automotive students delve into steering and suspension mechanics while mastering the intricacies of conduction transmission by while conducting transmission emission. Oh my, I'm gonna try that again. The intricacies of conduction transmission diagnostics. Woo, that's a big one. So you'll see a picture of that going on up here. Dobson's catering and special event management class dives into their fish challenge lab day and students were graded on plating and, fla and um, flavors. Mountain View graphics design students, you will see here, engaged in designing their projects for the 2024 Valley Metro Design a Transit uh, Wrap Contest. And I have to let you know that uh, past Mesa Public Schools students have um, done very well in that competition, so we wish them all the best. At, at Hale Elementary, students received a visit from the Arizona State Mine Inspector on our state's birthday, which is Valentine's Day. During the visit, students learned about the big five C's. If you are um, a student of Arizona, you know the five C's. Copper, cattle, cotton, citrus, and climate, and their significance in shaping Arizona's economy and identity. As a token of, pre of appreciation, students made a giant Valentine's card for their very distinguished guests. Here we go. Exciting news from Food and Nutrition. Mesa Public Schools is pleased to announce that through the community eligibility uh, provision of the national, oh, I was overactive clicking. Here we go. Uh, the National School Breakfast and Lunch Program, 45 qualifying students and five programs will soon be able to provide breakfast and lunch to their students at no charge. The program that I referred to, the acronym is CEP, will go into effect on March 1st of 2024 and will be in place throughout the 24-25 school year. We're thrilled about this opportunity to enhance access to nutritious meals and alleviate food insecurity within our school communities. Here we go. We've got some Mesa Marathon heroes to uh, celebrate. Once again, our transportation department are the unsung heroes of our community. Earlier this month, our dedicated yellow bus fleet warriors stepped up to provide essential transportation services for the Mesa Marathon participants. Despite the challenging conditions, including pouring rain, they arrived at about 2 a.m. with smiles on their faces, ready to ensure the success and safety of the event. Earlier this month, our communications and engagement team attended the Arizona School Public Relations Association, or what we call ASPRA, award ceremony. A big shout out, our communications team received recognition for their outstanding work, including accolades for By the Numbers publication, the Mesa Agenda Employee Newsletter. Our visual communications team was honored with multiple awards for their exceptional videos and photography. I'm very thankful that we have such talented people working in Mesa Public Schools. I'd like to call your attention to, um, the as we celebrate the end of Black History Month, I wanna recognize a partnership that Mesa Public Schools has with the Leading Men Found, uh, Fellowship. Leading Men Fellowship empowers and equips young men of color ages 18 to 24 with opportunities in the field of education by serving as paid, preschool literacy tutors. The fellows work as, as tutors in seven of our preschool classrooms with goals to improve literacy skills while increasing the number of black teachers in, our edu in early education. The Leading Men Fellowship and Hughes Elementary were recently featured on ABC 15. If you missed that segment and you're interested, you can uh, take a look on their website. Tomorrow, uh, tomorrow evening at 5.30, uh, Chief Cost from the Mesa Police Department and I will be hosting a town hall titled Addressing Teen Safety. Uh, that will be starting at 5.30. 
in the afternoon and we have a QR code here for anybody who would like to register. Um, we are expecting a great conversation around how we work collaboratively to ensure that our students are as safe as can be. Special days I'd like to share with you in March. First of all, when you take a look at that picture, I'm going to give another shout out to Westwood High School. Uh, they are in the Guinness Book of World Records for the largest pie sign. So here you go, lots of claims to fame in Mesa Public Schools. So in March is a National Women's History Month, Music in Our Schools Month, and Young Art Month. The third through the 9th of March is National Foreign Language Week. The third through the 9th is also National Social Worker Week. The 4th through the 8th is National School Breakfast Week and good old Pi Day, March 14th, uh, will be celebrated throughout our district. And as I mentioned earlier, spring break is 18, the 18th to the 22nd. Next up, we have a video featuring this year's Hacktivate Mesa event that was held at The Post in downtown Mesa. This is an amazing opportunity for our high school students to come to come together to solve big problems using real data and uh, all of the attitudes and skills inside of our portrait of a graduate. So with that, Chad, we are ready for the video. This is an amazing opportunity for the City of Mesa and Mesa Public Schools to come together to solve really big problems. It's a process of really trying to get our youth involved and engaged in our community. We're giving students an authentic voice in a community that they're part of. The minds that are in this room is a powerful deal. I'm not aware of other cities doing this, uh, so I think it should be a real point of pride for us here in Mesa. We are hosting an event with the high school students of Mesa Public Schools and we are having them look at our data and dive into all the information that the city has to look at the topics that keep the mayor awake at night to find out what we can do to improve things, make things better, uh, you know, get their ideas and find out what the youth have to say. The idea was is to find a good spectrum, a good diversity of students from each of our campuses uh, so that they could come here and listen to the information, listen to the data, listen to the mayor and hear what challenges the city faces. When you step out of the classroom and you go to an authentic place like this and you have uh, real data, it just bolsters the ability of students to really think about their influence and their understanding of what's going on around them. So uh, it's nothing we can replicate in a classroom. I've been able to watch my five students almost change and become less childlike and more adult-like. So to watch that power change, to watch that change, within an individual in a couple of hours, it's pretty awesome. Our research has led us to find that economics heavily affects the results of their grade literacy tests. On the following pages, you will see how different incomes throughout Arizona change the score of these tests. It really gives you a first on perspective of how things can be done because you, you, you can't, you see, like you learn by doing stuff, by reenacting stuff. So if you just keep constantly see, 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 or hear, 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 like you're not going to learn as much as actually implementing the ideas and actually working hands on as we did today. So I think it's a really good opportunity and I'm glad I just was like, yeah, sure, I'll do it. And then it ended up like being a really like good lesson. Hacktivate is a resume builder. This, sh this event should be on every one of these students' resumes so that they can tell their future employers, this is what I did at a very young age to be a part of my community, to really bring my strengths, my understanding of innovation and problem solving. So I want this to be a springboard for them to build their confidence that they are truly community contributors. Our promise to our community is that we will ready kids for college, career, and community and Hacktivate Mesa makes them a part of the process, a very essential part of the process. Have that, that little thing that I have, I think, in, 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 at least in some small measure, which is a lot for my own family. I was very proud of, of the city. I was very proud of the school district today. Uh, this, uh, this event, I think, represents both uh, organizations at a very high level. The city and the school district need to look for more opportunities to come together. The, the city of Mesa does not aspire to be in the education business. We, we're here in the supporting education business. And so if anything we can do to, to be the wind beneath the wings of, of our school districts, we're anxious to do that. And I think this is a good example of how we can come together and bring our, our relative strengths to create something that's, that's bigger than, than when we're separate.
to my update. Thank you, Dr. Forlis. Hacktivate is certainly a MESA event. And it's one that is, uh, is truly MESA when we're asking our youth to be empowered, not only with their intellect, but with their skills to help solve the problems that face our community. And they had some amazing solutions. But now I know a lot of you are here for the recognition part of our program. And at this time, we are going to recognize the Red Mountain Unified Basketball State Champions and the Mountain View Individual Wrestling State Champions. So board members, would you please join me at the front of the dais as we shake the hands of our state champions. You're in the right spot. So we are calling up our the Red Mountain uh, Unified Basketball Championship team. So everybody up here on that championship basketball team? Oh, okay. <laughs> you know what? Come one, come all, right? All righty. We're all Mesa. We are Mesa. All right. So let me tell you about these fine young group of people up here. Celebrating successes is just one of the ways that we ignite a culture of learning and well-being in Mesa Public Schools. We are committed to recognizing students, teachers, staff, and administrators for their achievements. Tonight, we will be honoring Red Mountain High School's unified basketball team and, in just a minute, our two state wrestling champions from Mountain View. So we're going to get started. Red Mountain's Unified Basketball Team recently won the AIA Unified Basketball State Championship. They beat Ironwood High 41-33 uh, to in the championship game to be Red Mountain's first Unified State Champions. And we have this fine team right here in attendance with us. We want to make sure that you have an opportunity um, to get a picture and to be congratulated by our board. But first, Coach I would, Jorge, I would love for you to come up and tell us just a little bit about uh, this team. And then we will do some pictures together and some handshakes. How about that? Come on up. You've got the mic. Hello. Thank you, guys, everybody, for coming. Madam President, thank you for having us. Dr. Flores, thank you. I'd like to thank the whole Red Mountain community, Mesa community, my wife. Um, these guys here, um, I've been working with Unified for the last two years now. Last year, we barely missed the playoffs. And then this year, we were able to get everybody um, through Register My Athlete. And then we just made a run with it. And the passion that these guys have for the game of basketball truly goes unnoticed, not only in our Unified program, but just on campus in general, which holds 3,600 kids. Um, these guys go out during lunch um, playing basketball with a smile on their face, and, and these guys are just welcomed by all and, and loved by all. I mean, you hear the MVP chants. You hear the, you hear the, the claps in the hallway. You hear the, you hear the, hey, what's up, Chase? Hey, like, these guys are just... They're one. It, it, we, it's, a, it's truly a culture, culture admiration to watch them um, be the students and players that they are on campus and on the court. And I'm just blessed and, and grateful to be their coach. Um, it really is a, a, an honor to be their coach. So I, I just can't thank you guys enough. And thank you again, Mesa community. Uh, Jason Grantham's here. Thank you to our AD. He's an amazing person and wouldn't have this opportunity that I do have without him. So. Thank you, everybody, for being here. I appreciate it.
And if you, if you are a proud family member or um, cheerleader for this fine team, will you please stand so we can recognize you for your support? All righty, we're not done celebrating our kids yet. Next up, we have two members of Mountain View's wrestling team. So can I have um, Dalton Kaufman, and now it's time, and Tanya Waske to come on up. Did I get that kind of right? A little bit. So let me tell you a little bit about Dalton and Tanya. Dalton is the Division I 175-pound state champion. He was undefeated this year, amassing a record of, you're not going to believe when I say it, but here I go, 52 to 0, and won the deepest, <laughs> and won the deepest weight in the division. Delton is the ultimate competitor and won 90% of his matches via bonus points, which is a staggeringly high percentage. We look forward to two more years in a Toro singlet as he works towards bringing home more state titles and rewriting the Mountain View Wrestling Record Book. No pressure, Dalton. All right, here we go. Tanya was the 2024 Division I 185-pound state champion finishing the year at 22-2. 21 of her 22. Yeah, there we go. Yes. <laughs> 21 of her 22 wins came via fall this year. So all in all, a dominant year. Tanya is a three-time state placer and two-time finalist. And this year, she realized her goal of becoming a state champion. Tanya is the first female champion in the history of Mountain View Wrestling. Congratulations to our Mountain View champions. So Delton and Tanya, we're going to have the governing board join you. We're going to jump in for a quick uh, picture. And if you are here to celebrate Delton and Tanya, please rise. We'd like to uh, share our appreciation with you as well. And as always to our public, um, many of you come for the celebrations. We are going to continue on with the business portion of our meeting. If you would like to go celebrate if you are part of the celebration team, it doesn't hurt our feelings if you would like to celebrate elsewhere. We will get on with our meeting.
wonderful celebrations of our students with a lot of firsts. First time United Unified Basketball State Champions, first time female wrestling champion. That's amazing. At this time, we have our um, personnel requests. Do I have a motion to approve the personnel requests, including the addendum? So moved. Mrs. Sears has moved. Is there a second? Second. Second by Ms. Davis. It's been moved and seconded to approve the personnel request, including the addendum. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, Ms. Kirby, would you please take our vote? With a vote of five yay, zero nay, we have approved the personnel request, including the addendum. With the approval of the personnel items, we have an in memoriam. Dr. Forrest, would you please tell us more? Yes, Madam President, members of the board, I would like to uh, provide in memoriam to Paul Cuevas. Paul was not just a security guard. He was a friendly face that greeted us every day with a warm smile and a kind word. His dedication to his work was evident in every shift that he worked, and he made sure that our schools and our district were safe and secure for all of us. His absence will be deeply felt by all of us, not only for his contributions to our safety, but also for the positive energy and kindness that he brought into the workplace every day. Paul leaves behind a legacy of professionalism, kindness, and dedication that will never be forgotten. Paul was respected and loved by staff, kids, and community. We miss that gentleman. At this time in our agenda, we have the call to the public. And um, we will now have our video on the call to the public procedures. The governing board welcomes comments from the public on non-agenda items. During the call to the public, please remember, as a general rule, public comments will be limited to three minutes. And the duration of an open call to the public will be 15 minutes. The president may set specific time limits for speakers and the duration of the call to the public to maximize the opportunity for individuals to offer their viewpoints. Comments must pertain to a matter that is within the jurisdiction of the governing board. This is not an appropriate forum to complain about an employee, student, or others. Please use the procedures established in policy KLD for this purpose. State law prohibits board members from commenting on or discussing the matters presented. At the end of the call to the public, the board may ask the superintendent to review the issue or place it on a future agenda. A board member may also briefly respond to criticism of a board member or the governing board. Thank you for allowing this meeting to be conducted in a peaceful and productive manner. So at this time, we have 22 folks that would like to address the board during public comment. We're going to um, allow each person two minutes. And what I'll do is I'll call names in groups of three. And would you please be ready to address the board um, when your name is called? And when you do address the board, would you please state your name and your affiliation with Mesa Public Schools? So our first three folks that will be talking with us tonight are Graham Core, Dr. Lee Costanzo, and Cynthia Alanis. And I'm sorry if I have mispronounced names. Graham Core, please. Thank you. Testing, testing. Hello. Hi. Hi, uh, full house tonight. 
Uh, hi, my name is Mr. Graham. I'm a special education teacher at Rose Junior High School just up the road. I wanted to come to the mic tonight to thank the district and the board and specifically SPED staff at the district level for this thing we do called the Student Service Awards. Every year, the special education department puts on an award show for staff and students who work in and around the special education department. Uh, two years ago, at the end of my first year of teaching, I walked away with one of the Rookie of the Year awards, which was like this huge positivity boost. It's one of the things that helped me stay a special education teacher in the city of Mesa. And at the end of last school year, with the help of Kristen Van Schoik, David O'Neill, Carolina Melendez, Chelsea Nez, Elizabeth Watts, and all the other special education folks on my campus, uh, as well as a nomination from Dr. Lee Preston, I walked away with the spectacular SPED Education Teacher of the Year Award, which again, that was another award that was like a huge thing. Uh, I also walked away with a note saying I wasn't allowed to win any more awards since. <laughs> uh, and uh, this year, I'm super happy to announce, since I'm no longer eligible, I nominated most of the, uh, all the students on my caseload, and one of them actually won. And it's, this is the first time in their life they've won a citywide award like this. They were absolutely elated when I told them they had won, and the city of Mesa is actually coming into my classroom to film the student. I was able to write up a little uh, paragraph or so that'll be read aloud once the award is presented and the student will actually be, be receiving a trophy with my words etched into it. I just think it's this fabulous program, the Student of Service Awards that we do in the city of Mesa. I think it's absolutely fantastic. Uh, I nominated the student for the award just so that when they go off to high school, uh, I've been working with the student for since sixth grade up until the end of the eighth grade. I just never want them to forget the growth that they've made and this trophy allows them to never forget that. So I just wanted to thank the district for always hosting this award show every year. It's absolutely worth the money. Thanks. Good evening, board, uh, community members. My name is Dr. Leanne Costanzo. I'm a family medicine physician. I practice and live in the city of Mesa. I'm here because I'm a member of the Arizona chapter of Gays Against Groomers. We are against the medicalization, sterilization, and indoctrination of children. We want you to leave the kids alone. This is not something that is negotiable. The Arizona statute passed in 2010 allows the parents to direct the upbringing of their children. Yet once again, I have heard that Mesa Public Schools decided in their infinite wisdom that a book should be read to children between the ages of kindergarten and second grade called Calvin. This book is about a young man who, a young woman who decides that she is a boy and her family transitions her and all, of, and all that goes along with that. Now, I am not against a parent's desire to do anything with their child. However, I am very against that kind of information being presented to young children who have no idea that this is even going on. We do not allow children to come to school as dogs or cats. We do not allow them to cut off body parts to be a pirate. We do not allow them to come to school dressed in their dinosaur costumes because they think they are a dinosaur. These are children. They do not know what they don't know. It is time for us to stop doing this. It is time for Mesa Public Schools to put on the agenda and pass a resolution that, per that prohibits the use of any name other than the name that the child was given. Your own pledge is to know every child by name. Make that name the name that their parents gave them. Thank you. Uh, my name is Cynthia Lenice. I am the mother of five children enrolled in Mesa Public Schools, elementary and high school. And I came again to thank the board for um, putting processes in place to protect our LGBTQ youth, especially our trans youth. Um, last week in Oklahoma, 
there was a non-binary student who was beat to death for using the wrong restroom. Um, and even with the policies that are in place with the district, it became horrifically real that because of the misinformation and just not even an attempt to get actual, um, have actual conversations with LGBTQ youth and their families, um, it's very scary that even with these policies in place that this could happen in Mesa. Um, so I just wanna urge the board to continue protecting trans youth, LGBTQ youth, and to continue um, talking to the community, continue getting the information directly from the source rather than pulling them out of thin air and um, understanding that these protections are increasing the life expectancy of these kids. They would not be here, they would not be alive if they didn't feel safe. So I just wanna thank you from the bottom of my heart for, for always um, listening and just giving us the opportunity to, to feel comfortable um, having our kids on campus. Thank you. I'd, I'd like to remind the audience, please not to respond verbally to um, comments that are made to be in with respect to the speaker. Um, clapping is okay, but um, verbal comments, if we could keep those down, I would really appreciate it. Um, our next three speakers um, would be Ed Steele, Sharon Benson, and Tiffany Benson. Good evening, members of the board, superintendency. My name is Ed Steele. I'm a community member and a candidate for this Mesa Public Schools Governing Board. I wanna talk about two things if I get the time. Uh, raise the bar. I'm gonna ask you all to please raise the bar. We know that it needs to be raised. So a couple of meetings ago, I made the assertion that you're violating state statute by allowing the trans gay, gay pride uh, BLM flags to be flown in this district. Um, I was reminded and sent an email uh, by Ms. King stating that according to Black's Law Dictionary, that definition isn't the same as what the general public might think. Even if I concede to you, which I don't, that those don't violate state statute, raise the bar. You know, don't make that your level of how do you decide what to do in this district. You know, you certainly need to follow the law, but then step it up and say, not only can we do this, but should we do this? Will, will implementing this policy or make these allowances, will that benefit the greatest number of students in this district? And I don't think you're, you're answering that question sufficiently. The second thing I wanna talk about is accountability. You guys continually bring in memorandum of understanding, statement of assurances that have clearly stated goals and objectives. And I'll give you an example, uh, the Gear Up program. Primary objective is to increase the number of low-income in low students prepared to enter and succeed in post-secondary education. I made a FOIA request to see what that evaluation was, and I was told the district doesn't have it. Why are you bringing in programs to this district with the intent on improving education, and then you have no idea if, the, if that's accomplishing its goals. You guys do better. Um, hello, Governing Board uh, Superintendent. I am Sharon Benson, a multi-stakeholder position person in this district, an employee, non of a student, uh, employee, uh, parent of employees, um, a graduate of Westwood. I can go on with my um, background, but I also am adding a stakeholder position, and that is candidate for the Mesa Public Schools Governing Board. So... I wasn't planning on talking 
uh, at public comment. But I started watching the study session and I just get so frustrated because um, we face declining enrollment and the um, excuses are low birth rates, high properties, high, high property values, high interest rates. Yet since 2017, our student population has dropped by 4,900 kids. Pretty sure they were already born. The low birth rate did not affect that. Um, second, I heard um, in the study session earlier, Dr. O'Reilly made a comment that um, Georgetown said, you know what, don't worry about the families that have left. Just worry about the families that are still here. Make sure you're providing for their needs. Uh, you're not. You're violating parental rights on a regular basis. Parents have the right to raise their children. They don't belong to the government. As a small business owner, my husband and I would have gone out of business years ago if we lost customers and didn't try to gain them back in whatever manner we could. It's time public schools get back to being public schools rather than government schools and try to win these families back by pro providing them with the quality education Tiffany Benson. I am the founder of Restore Parental Rights in Education, and Excuse I am a Mesa me, Ms. community Ms. Benson, advocate. Could you tell us what your affiliation with Mesa Public Schools I just told you. I am a Mesa community advocate. Okay, okay. I'm a community Thank member. You. So what I've come to do is to tell the good people of Mesa that your kids now think more like racists after going through BLM at school this month. Only a pro-segregation district would teach kids to identify people by their skin color. For the record, Black Lives Matter doesn't represent me or my community, and you shouldn't need a special program to hire more black teachers. Affirmative action is not the law of this land anymore. So parents and community members, your call to action this November is to flip these seats and to fire every incompetent administrator. Okay. If you are looking to leave MPS, you should come to the school choice event that's happening in April. More details can be found on my website, restoreparentalrights.org. And for everyone in the district, employee, whoever, if you're complicit with, split, with spreading BLM and transgenderism, you need to start looking for another job. You need to find another place to go because your time is about up. I'd like to remind folks to keep their conversations down, particularly when someone is speaking. We need to be respectful of everyone that is speaking. Please be respectful of everyone that is speaking and appreciate it. Particularly when you're so close to the podium. Thank you. We have three more speakers. John Amanachuku, Sloan Adams, and Joyce Miller. My name is John Amanachuku, which means I know God. And my affili affiliation is that I'm the voice of one crying out in the wilderness, make straight the way of the Lord. First and foremost, this district is a fraud. And those who sit on this board who push demonic and satanic laws upon children, God is going to judge you harshly. The Bible says, be not deceived. God is not mocked. Whatsoever a man sows, that shall he also reap. If you sow demonic influences into the lives of children, you will reap it. If you pervert the hearts and the minds of kids, 
in this district, you will reap it. If you sit back smug in your chairs with your colored hair, thinking that you own this state, and that you're God. We did the Pledge of the Allegiance. And it was a sham to listen to people get quiet when we said that we're a nation under God. We've lost our way. And then you gaslight people that look like me. White liberals have always done that. It's not anything new. And since we're in Black History Month, let me tell you something. First and foremost, you're using black people in this district like puppets. We only represent 4.8% of the students in this district anyway. But then you want to hold a Black Lives Matter at school week of action. Gaslighting. Convincing blacks that you are concerned about them on Wednesday as it relates to being inclusive and affirming. And then you use a book with a black boy on it who's a transgender. I'm disgusted. You racist bigots who sit back in your chair and allow this. And you, you, yes, you black sister, how dare you sit on this board and let this take place? You need to be voted off first. What a shame you all are. Why are you so quiet? Mr. Machugu, your, your time is done. Thank you. It's going to be real hard to follow that, but here it goes. Sloan Adams, I represent churches here in the Mesa District. Ladies and gentlemen of the board, Webster's 1828 Dictionary of the English Language defines education as the bringing up as of a child, instruction, formation of manners. Education comprehends all that series of instruction and discipline which is intended to enlighten the understanding, correct the temper, and form the habits of manners of youth, and fit them for usefulness in their future stations. To give good children a good education in manners, arts, and science is important. To give them a religious education is indispensable. And an immense responsibility rests on parents and guardians who neglect these duties. Noticeably absent from this foundational understanding of education is a discussion of human sexuality. Why? Because human sexuality is based solely on a self-evident understanding of Genesis 126 and 27. Then God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness and let us let them have complete authority over the fish of the sea, the birds of the air, the cattle and over the entire earth. So God created man in his own image and the image and likeness of God. He created them male and female. He created them. In other words, there are only two sexes. If you're struggling to figure out which one you are, then look down. And if you don't like the way you were born, then be born again. The second reason why our foundational paradigm of education was devoid of any reference to human sexuality is because our founders knew that the primary context in which education was to take place was not in a school building, but in the home where parents and guardians would implement standards that would necessarily teach morality to children as they grow up. It has been said that foolishness is bound up in the heart of the child, but it is the rod of reproof that will drive it far from him. To summarize, the factory settings of a child are foolishness, and it takes discipline to teach them wisdom. There are those on this board who believe, like Albert Kinsey and John Money, that children have sexual needs from birth, and that base desires must be liberated by any means necessary. It is time to Thank you. My name is Joyce Miller, and I'm a parent of four kids that have been through the public school system, and now I have 10 grandchildren, and most of them are homeschooled because of uh, situations and things that they're concerned about the public school. And my concern is, is everybody on this board is concerned about the safety and the welfare of our children. And I have something I would like to introduce to you, a program that I think would be very beneficial to the Mesa public school system, 
and it's school chaplains for the schools, uh, grade schools and high schools. And this is a program that started in Texas, and they have a thousand chaplains that are now into the school systems. They have a chaplaincy school uh, act that was promoted through the government, and now they're able to have chaplains in the homeschool. And there's also chaplains over 32 different countries, and they're having very positive results with safety among the children as well as the staff. And uh, one of you know the job descriptions is to be there you know in the time of crisis. And there's crises going all on in our families and in the teachers as well. So if there's uh, attempted suicide, accidents on the campus, um, just you know teachers with stress issues that there's someone that they can talk with and they be, can be prayed for and be comforted. And uh, some of the examples are that uh, the, the chaplains, if there's an accident on the school campus, they would be at the hospital with the family to be able to offer support and to pray for those that would like prayer. And uh, this, the actual uh, the website for this is natural school national school chaplain association.org and um, I've you know I've had an experience you know I've been an ICU nurse for many years and I've worked with foster care children and also with child crisis and I need I see the need for thank you Our next three speakers are Tammy Stoss, Rhonda Carlson, and Elizabeth Tanner. Good evening. President Hutchinson, esteemed board members, superintendency, thanks so much for taking the time to listen to my voice and the voices of the community. Um, I want to celebrate and do a shout out for Public School Week. As a proud public school teacher and proud parent of two graduates of Mesa Public Schools, I am truly in love with public schools. So I also want to thank you all for the, all the hard work you do every day. Um, along with all of our teachers that are here at this board meeting tonight and listening, thank you all for everything you do for our kids. Okay. Um, I'd also like, you, like to thank you all for your commitment to the continued support of all the students in Mesa Public Schools. And I truly believe, I think I've shared with you my story before, but for those of you who have not heard my story, I'm the parent of a proud transgender son and a non-binary child. These guidelines that Mesa Public Schools has for supporting transgender students and non-binary students in our public school system truly helped my son become the amazing adult he is today. I believe if we did not have these policies in place, he would not have been able to excel, to feel safe, and to get the education that he so deserved. I really truly believe that these guidelines are helping all children in Mesa Public Schools and that they're helping save lives. There was a mention of a non-binary student who was recently um, attacked in a school in Oklahoma. And I believe that if these policies had been in, that pl in place in that school, that would not have happened. Thank you so much for your continued commitment to all of our kids. Excuse me, can you please take your conversation out? I'm not, I'm not harassing you, Mr. Hamlet. Mr. Hamlet, excuse me, Mr. Hamlet. Mr. Hamlet, I can, Mr. Hamlet. I can hear you, but most importantly, you're, they're right by the speaker. Please be no, respectful of the speaker. I can hear you. you cannot. Tell me I can I hear you. 
Mr. Hamlin, I'm not going to discuss it with you. Please refrain from talking, particularly when there's a speaker at the podium. Be respectful to the speaker. The Thank you. Ms. Is it Ms. Carlson? It is. Thank you, Ms. Carlson. Go ahead, please. Thank you. Uh, I actually didn't expect to be quite as nervous as I am, so um, I, if I stumble a little, I'm sorry. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I'm here today to talk about public education. Uh, I'd first like to thank the governing board and all the members who have come before you uh, for this opportunity to speak today, because I know at some school boards uh, that's not allowed. Um, I want to thank you for your dedication to students. It's easy to criticize from the sideline, but true courage and commitment comes by demonstrating, uh, is demonstrated by those who actively participate. Public school is more than just classrooms and textbooks. For some students, school is the only safe place they know. It's where they go to eat the only meal they'll get that day. The bus driver, the lunch lady, their teacher, they're the only people who speak kindness to them. In our classrooms, we encounter students with many needs. In Mesa, it is our goal to know every student by name, serve them by strength and need, and each educator is tasked with moving them toward college, career, and community. Today, we have heard or will hear all of the reasons why we're doing it wrong. I challenge the naysayers of public education to put your own ideologies and agendas to the side and recognize that without public education, we fail as a society. Prior to the institution of public schools, rich children were educated by private tutors. Some children were educated in churches supported by towns. Towns and parents would get together and pay the tuition of a traveling schoolmaster. We would have one room schoolhouses and working apprenticeships were the norm. So was child labor. But there is a section of society that couldn't even attend these institutions and did not have access to learning opportunities afforded to students that I just spoke about. And that's what I was here to talk about. Hi. You got my six, right? <laughs> okay, I'm a little nervous up here, especially given the uh, angst of the, the room at the moment. Um, started getting a little heated there, I'm just a little stressed. My name is Elizabeth Tanner, and um, please don't laugh at me. Thank you, I don't appreciate it. I'm a strong person, but I still don't appreciate it. Um, my name is Elizabeth Tanner, I'm language and literature teacher at Westwood High School, and I teach my students to respect their fellow person and the classroom. I am here today to say thank you to the board for your continuous support of your teachers and your students. Thank you for being here. Thank you for everything that you help us do. I would like to recognize the importance of keeping books in the classroom, the library, and the school overall. The help that, the overall help that our students and our children see themselves and get from the books, they're able to see mirrors in the books of themselves and to see what they want to be, what they can be in a place that perhaps they never thought they could. Yes, as earlier one of my predecessors said, school is a safe place that they can come to, whereas oftentimes home is not. School is the one place they can look forward to coming to and being supported by a teacher, by an admin, by a staff, by another student. They need that. In addition, I will always do and always will support my students, whoever they are, whoever they want to be. I will teach them to think, and I hope they will think critically. Thank you. At this time, our next three speakers will be Josh Chilton, Paul Shelton, and Kelly Berg. Yeah, 
Good evening, Madam Speaker, board members, uh, Dr. Forlis. Uh, thank you again for having us uh, having us an opportunity to speak tonight. Um, my name is Josh Chilton. I am a proud parent of a fifth grader in Mesa Public Schools. And um, like a few members here, uh, I'm also proud to say that I'll be a candidate for Mesa Public Schools in 2024. Uh, when I first came today, my plan was to talk about the ice cream social at Franklin and Jordan Elementary. I hope that you come and visit us. My, uh, my wife is on the PTO. I'm going to be the DJ out there. We're going to have candy, ice cream, all sorts of good stuff. It's the support of community like you that makes these schools possible. Um, but I see I've still got a minute and 16 left. So a few other things I'd like to say. As I come here, I am proud. I am proud as a father of a student at Mesa Public Schools. I'm proud as an American. I'm proud to be in a room right now where I can say anything I want to the board members and everybody will listen. I am proud that we have people here who can be so brave in a room of so many people against them and what they believe that they can still come up here and say their piece. I'm proud of the parents who just want what's best for their students when they go to public school. I'm even proud that someone can stand here and call members of the board bigots and there's nothing the board can do. They sit there and they take it for no, no pay whatsoever, just for the love of Mesa Public Schools. The work that you do is fantastic. I am proud to be a Mesa Public School student what I, or school parent. What I am not proud of, though, are people who are brave and get up here and are laughed at and booed and interrupted. Shall I? My name is Paul Shelton. I grew up in Mesa and I am a teacher here now. Being a kid is difficult. As a teacher, I do my best to support students as well as I can. However, there are many times when I feel my reach is too short. Students deal with problems at home ranging from abuse to homelessness and problems outside of class such as bullying. I encourage the board to continue supporting our students in facing all these challenges in spite of recent budget, budget news, because children are limited in what they can face on their own. The more support we give them, the better a future they can create for us, themselves and for our country. And since I have just a bit more time, I wanted to add, since none of you have been inside my classroom, I want to assure you I'm not asking for the support so I can indoctrinate anybody. I am not trying to change their gender or their sexuality or tell them to join my religion or anything like that. I really just want them to have the skills they need to create a better future for themselves and hopefully give that skill, give those skills, give those talents back to their community. That's all I want. Thank you for supporting me so far. I hope you can support us in the future. Good evening, Madam President, school board members, and superintendency. Kelly Berg, I'm the president of Mesa Education Association. I am the mother of four teenage boys, um, so my grocery bill is very large. Um, one of them is a graduate of Mesa Public Schools and is very successful right now at SCC in the culinary program there, and is happy that he is um, well prepared for a job in his field in his given career. He is excited that he is now working at Angry Crab Shack and <laughs> very excited, me too. Um, my second son is in Calc 2, planning on taking Calc 3 and AP Statistics next year. I thank you for the resources that our students can have to take these classes. And my twins, they are in seventh grade and just starting to begin to figure out what they want to do. I'm a proud mom, a proud former student of Mesa Public Schools, I attended Jefferson, Rhodes, nope, not Rhodes, sorry, Jefferson, uh, Robson, Holmes, and Taylor Junior High before moving out of state. Um, 
I am glad that I have landed back here in Mesa. I've been teaching here for 27 years and I wouldn't want it any other way. I do want to share some information. The Mesa Education Association supports the certified staff of Mesa Public Schools. Our number one priority in MPS is to teach every student regardless of their race, gender, religion, socioeconomic status, or zip code. We are dedicated to knowing them by name, serving our students by strengths and needs, and preparing them for college, career, and community. In order for students to be successful with their learning, they need to feel safe, have a sense of belonging, feel valued, respected, and included. We strive to create inclusive environments where students can reach their full potential. One key to student success is fostering collaborative parent relationships. Education is similar to a three-legged stool. For complete balance, the teacher... I'm going to again ask folks to please take the conversations outside. And most of you are really being very, very kind about that and respecting the speaker. Thank you so much. I have our next three speakers are Mr. Mark Kimball, Representative Lorena Austin, and Representative Seth Blattman. Board members, uh, superintendency, um, it's good to be here this evening. We've we've heard a lot, and uh, I think some of you are going to go home tonight, hopefully with a little different perspective. Uh, a couple of times before when I came up to spoke, I ran out of time. Just as I was going to, I have no other opportunity or form to do this, uh, directed at Councilwoman um, or Board Member Davis. Um, I'll just say, I hope you you listen and choose your path because um, you're new. And I hope you uh, follow the right examples <clears throat> and the parents. Uh, you know, it's interesting what happens is when politicians or board members don't listen because they think sometimes they know better than those that they serve or the parents. We see it with politicians all the time. They get they follow their special interest group or, or whatever it is they're seeking, but their constituents are left hanging and wonder what the heck happened. I grew up here, Westwood, many years ago. My mother served in the counseling department at Westwood for many years. We didn't have all the fringe stuff and the things that we're facing today. My goodness, we, we had an, an awesome time. We had a great education. Mesa was known for the school board. And you know why? Because the focus was on the education, the pillars of education. And they didn't bend to a fringe few. They cared about the students. But when you go off on fringes, the majority can suffer. And we're seeing that happen today. There's been great words of wisdom spoken tonight. I hope that people can see this on cable. All set. Uh, good evening, uh, members of the board, Dr. Forlis, and everyone in attendance today. My name is Lorena Austin. I'm the state representative for Legislative District 9, which covers West Mesa and Tempe. And I'm here to, to thank you all. Um, we've heard a lot of comments today. What, what I can say is a fifth generation Arizonan and someone who has spent the better half of two years knocking doors and talking to constituents is that our parents care about public schools. They care about their children. They have and put input and speak to you all. I go with Dr. Forlis pretty often to visit schools around our district, to talk to our students, and they're just absolutely wonderful. They say amazing things about the staff and faculty and teachers and administrators. Um, I, I 
visited Mesa High last Friday, I think. Days just go by so fast. I spent the entire day at Mesa High. I visited six classrooms and two clubs after school, and we had an absolute blast talking about um, uh, their future. I visited some AVID classes to really encourage our students to, to really take grasp of their education and go further with it to attend higher education if they so wished, but also to um, look at good quality jobs that don't necessarily need a, a four-year degree. Um, but I have 50 seconds left, and I, I would really like to say, um, again, I appreciate the board. I mean, it really gives me pause that people can, who are not even from our community come into this chamber and point at two of the people that I see most in our community. Kiana Sears, our first black uh, school board member here in Mesa Public Schools, thank you. Um, to Marcy Hutchinson, thank you. You have been a public servant for over 40 years now uh, for our students. And so um, I just want uh, people to know that Mesa is diverse. It is inclusive. It wants to have representation. And if they didn't, I would not be standing here in front of you because I know what I, what I look like. And so Mesa looks like me, it looks like you, looks like the people on the board, and I'm so proud to represent it, and I will always fight for it. Uh, my name is Seth Blattman, I'm representative of LD9. I, uh, I know to never follow Lorena Austin when I speak. It's always... Uh, a bad, uh, bad thing to do, but I did want to come here today and thank uh, the members of the board and everyone else here, staff, for the work they're doing to serve our community. I also did want to take this opportunity uh, in public comment to say at the legislature, we're also hard, uh, hard working on issues that are important to the Mesa community. I have a bill that is focused on protecting children on social media that is working its way through the process. It should get voted out of the House soon and on the way to the Senate. And I am uh, asking for and welcoming um, public input from the board, from parents, from community members. Uh, we've already included many stakeholders, parents along the way, but I want to hear everyone's input so we can have uh, the best legislation possible. But protecting children on social media is a priority of everyone. Uh, bipartisan, Republicans, Democrats, independents, we all agree it's a top priority. So um, I'm going to give you back the last minute so you can all get out of here a little earlier. Thank you. Our next three speakers are Rachel Clay, Beth Buckman, and Sandra Lean. Good evening. I didn't plan on speaking tonight, um, so I didn't prepare anything. But um, I'm Rachel Colay. I'm a teacher at Westwood High School. Both of my sons graduated from Westwood High School, and I'm a proud parent. Uh, and teacher in public schools, and I wanted to thank you for hearing what I have to say today. Um, I really came here to talk about the my students' access to books. Um, I I wore my Project Lit T-shirt. I'm the um, I'm the sponsor of the Poetry Club at Westwood. We have a partnership with the Mesa Art Center, where students uh, come after school and they write poetry. Um, and I just wanted to say how important it is that students have access to a variety of books that reflect their lives, show them the lives of others, and um, help them be, you know, be transported into other worlds. Um, there, are, there are all kinds of books out there, and I think it's a really important to keep access open for students. Um, and that's all I wanted to say. Thank you again. Hello, my name is Beth Buckman. I'm an English teacher at Westwood High School, and though I work, work closely with Rachel Collet, we did not uh, collaborate on any of the uh, <laughs> any of our speeches today. But mine is quite similar to hers. Um, I want to speak today in support of our absolutely amazing library at Westwood. Um, because of uh, every, <laughs> because of our amazing librarian, Lori Simmons, I was able to create a learning unit that encourages engagement and connections with literature. 
Every week, I have the honor of witnessing teenagers engrossed in novels that they chose from our library. Some of the, uh, because of Mrs. Simmons' dedication to curating books that accommodate a variety of student interests and backgrounds, I have students that ask, Miss, can we read today? Thank you. Good evening. My name is Sandra Lean, and I am an orchestra teacher at Smith Junior High and Stevenson Elementary. And I just wanted to recognize the Honors Orchestra Program for the elementary and junior high students. It's MYPO, the Mesa Young People's Orchestra, and JHFO, which is Junior High Festival Orchestra. My old district did not have a program like this. This program allows the opportunity to advance um, each student's playing abilities by simulating a real life orchestral experience. I had no idea this existed, and I love that Mesa has an arts program that allows students to excel in many different ways. Thank you. And our last speaker tonight in public comment is Frank Bennett. My name is Frank Bennett. Uh, I put down my affiliation as being with Mesa High School, which is that I'm a proud graduate of Mesa High. We're the class that's really fine. We're the class of 59. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a Mesa kid. My mother was a teacher and a counselor. She was one of the co-founders of the MEA. Thanks to Mesa Schools, I was able to go to a good college. I got good grades there and I've had success in my life. My kids all went to Mesa schools and they're all productive members of our community now. I'm on a committee that uh, interviews kids for, for scholarships uh, every year we, uh, with an emphasis on community service. And uh, we give out four, this year, four $2,500 scholarships and four $1,500 scholarships, and and I wish that we I wish we could tape the interviews. The kids are unbelievable. They are products of, of Mesa Public Schools, and we get kids that are, we've had uh, Dreamers, we've had DACA kids, uh, we've had kids from uh, every piece of Mesa, and uh, unfailingly, they talk about how wonderful their school experience has been, and uh, their teachers uh, that uh, that they've has led have led them through the through the process. And I really came tonight to say thanks to the school board. You, uh, it's a uh, it's a tough, uh, if not impossible, job. I really wonder sometimes if this was going on when I was in school. I wish the kids sometimes. I wish the kids could come and listen. I can't. Be well, anyway. Thank you very much. That's the end of public comment tonight. Our next agenda item is the consent agenda. These items are considered as a group. There is no discussion. Is there a motion to approve the consent agenda according to the recommended action for each item? So moved. Ms. Sears has moved. Is there a second? Second. Ms. Davis has seconded. It's been moved and seconded to approve the consent agenda according to the recommended action for each item. Ms. Kirby, would you please take our vote? With a vote of five yeas and zero nays, we have passed the consent agenda. Next item on our agenda is the acceptance of audits and appliance questionnaire and presentation of the 2023 
Annual Comprehensive Financial Report and the External Auditor's Compliance Findings. Is there a motion to approve the audits and compliance questionnaire? So moved. Ms. Davis has moved. Is there a second? Second. Second by Mrs. Walden. Is there any discussion by the board? Is there any presentation by administration? Mr. Thompson? Yes, madam. Madam President, we have our uh, external auditor here, uh, Jennifer Shields, who will share a quick update on the uh, information before you today. Mr. Thompson, would you please state our guest's name again? Jennifer, do you want to inter be clicking in and out? I don't know why. Old Meach. Jennifer Shields. Okay. Welcome to Mesa Public Schools Thank Governing Board Meeting. Mr. Thompson, is there a PowerPoint for me somewhere? Thank you. Uh, I think you? you're okay now. Let's, oh. oh, the clicker. Sorry. Okay, thank you. Um, Madam President, members of the board, Dr. Forlis, Mr. Thompson, superintendency, everyone in attendance, thank you for allowing me just a few minutes to speak with you tonight about um, the audit that the district goes through um, every year. So let's see. All right, um, we'll start out. Um, there are a number of items that I am required as your external auditor to um, share with the board. Um, and some of that includes the information in this um, PowerPoint tonight. You also were provided some literature um, in the form of a, um, a PDF letter. And so this um, presentation tonight will sort of recap what's in all of the documents that you've been provided. So you can see the timeline up on the board. This is the audit for the year ended June 30th, 2023. So as you can tell, um, we're already in February of 24. So quite a number of months have passed since the um, end of the fiscal year. But as many of you are aware, the, um, there, are, there are, is a lot of transaction and clean up processes that um, go through beyond June 30th until the point at which, um, and, and Dr. Forlis um, mentioned it earlier in her um, superintendency comments that there's an annual financial report that is required to be submitted to the state by October 15th. So once October 15th passes, that's when um, the audit can really kind of get going in full force. So um, the reports themselves were issued December of 23 and they met all of the required timelines for filing deadlines. So I'd like to report that. Um, in terms of the scope of the services, you can see those are up there on the board. We are hired by the district to perform an audit in accordance with US generally accepted accounting stand or um, yeah, auditing standards rather, um, government auditing standards, and then also the uniform guidance. And we're also hired to complete a uniform system of financial records compliance questionnaire, which um, goes to the state of Arizona for the Auditor General's office to determine overall compliance with state rules and regulations. Um, there are a number of different responsibilities that are, you know, my responsibilities as your auditor. And then there are responsibilities of management. So you can see up there, we have some um, information for you about our responsibilities. Um, we are uh, bound by our standards to design an audit that um, provides reasonable but not absolute assurance. Um, and that we note that management is ultimately responsible for the financial statements of the district. And although we do make fraud inquiries and design our audit procedures so that we would um, be aware of any fraud like um, concerns within the district. The ultimate responsibility for putting programs in place to prevent and deter fraud um, rests with management and the board. Uh, this year, there were um, there was one accounting standard that was implemented. It has a very long title. It's called we call it SPIDAS for short, but essentially what it is is a new accounting standard that requires any long term liabilities related to subscriptions be recorded on the district's financial statements. So the district went through the process of making sure that all of the information necessary to implement that standard. Um, 
was um, prepared and, and provided to the audit team uh, for review and implementation of that new audit standard, or rather accounting standard. Um, with any set of financial statement audits, there are significant estimates. The most significant estimates that the district has in your financial statements are the useful lives for depreciable assets. There are estimated but not incurred claims related to insurance for both um, accidents, property, and employee health and wellness. And then there are um, some very large assumptions that are made in actuarial valuations that relate to the um, pension plans, and that information goes into your financial statements as well. Um, in terms of audit adjustments, I'm pleased to report that we did not have any audit adjustments during the course of our audit procedures that need to be brought to your attention this evening. And let's see. Um, also, there are some non-audit services that Heinfeld Meach provides for the district. So um, those non-audit services um, are the preparation and assistance of the financial statements, the notes to the financial statements. So essentially, there are quite, um, in, in those uh, financial statements that were provided to you, it's like over 100 and some pages long, um, we assist the district with preparing that information by taking your source data and putting it into the format that's required by generally accepted accounting principles. Um, we also assist with the preparation of your schedule of expenditures of federal awards and the related data collection form necessary for um, filing with the federal government. Um, other required communications, we had no disagreements with management over accounting or um, reporting or audit matters. We um, obtained all of the required disclosures from management at the conclusion of the audit, um, sort of like a long list of you know, all the things we asked for, they assert that they provided to us so that we could complete the audit in a timely fashion. And then our professional standards also require that we um, make sure that we adhere to our professional standards about ethical responsibilities and independence, and we had no violations on our side with respect to those that I would need to report to you tonight. Um, in terms of the audit reports that were issued and that you have copies of, I believe you have those electronically. There was an annual comprehensive financial report. That's that I saw Ms. Ms. Hutchinson, you pulled that up. That's that yellow one, the very long uh, financial report. And that um, includes all of the financial data as well as a lot of other information I can run through quickly in, a, in another slide. There's also something called the single audit reporting package and then that USFR compliance questionnaire that I mentioned. So that, um, that yellow uh, paper document that you have with the, the bright yellow cover, um, that is very lengthy. And so I'm not going to run through all of these pages, but I highlighted for you some of the, um, the and I put the page numbers of the PDF in case you're looking at the PDF version, not the actual print version. Um, but those might be um, particular pieces of information where you might look to find additional information. I will just point out that the independent auditor's report was unmodified, which um, sort of in layman's terms, it's the uh, clean opinion that you're hoping to get at the end of the audit. So no, um, no material misstatements um, in the financial statements. So that's what that says. In terms of the single audit reporting package, this one's only 11 pages, so much easier to digest. Um, the um, final page of that particular document has what's called the schedule of findings and question costs, and it's a nice one-page summary of ultimately all of the audit results. What it'll say in there is that there were no significant deficiencies or material weaknesses in internal control that were noted during the audit. And it also outlines which major federal programs were subject to audit under the uniform guidance. And you can see on the screen, we audited the Title I program, the Special Education Program, and then also the Education Stabilization Fund, which um, you all know as the ESSER program. So those were the federal programs that were audited. And then, let's see. Okay, and then the last document is that USFR um, compliance questionnaire. And so this document is issued by the Auditor General's Office of the State. They put this out, it's 36 pages of um, questions and it's designed so that the auditor will provide, um, will perform audit tests over those particular areas. And there are, are only options on the questions. 
are to either answer yes, no, or not applicable. And so we designed tests over 18 different areas. And I've just highlighted a few of them on the screen for you just to give you an idea that this covers more than just the finance office and finance you know, department. We hit all sorts of areas within the district including procurement. We look at expenditures, we look at cash, we look at accounting records. Of course, those items all rest within finance, but we do also look at things like student attendance, student activities, you know, clubs and organizations and that type of thing. And then, let's see. And then just um, final comments, as always, um, I just like to say this is a huge undertaking for the district to go through this process. You go through it every single year and um, it's, it's no easy feat for um, all of the administration to pull together all of the information and the data. So I'd just like to thank everybody who is a part of that um, and let you all know that management and everybody that we dealt with here at the district was incredibly helpful during the audit process, which allowed for um, all of this information to be completed in a timely manner. And with that, I think that's all I have and I'd be happy to stand for questions. Thank you, Jennifer. Also, I would mention that uh, in addition to all this information being public in the agenda this evening, it's also available on our website uh, for the public. Thank you very much for that reminder. Do any board members have any questions, comments, concerns, ideas at this time? Seeing, seeing none. I, I, I like I like phrases like no audit adjustments, no disagreements, no significant deficiencies, and everyone was helpful. A clean audit, which is the norm for Mesa Public Schools and which we are an award-winning district for. So, Ms. Shields, I want to really thank you for being here tonight and for providing all of this information. It's very, very um, important that folks know that we are accountable for the finances of this district. And well done, staff, and, and your staff as well. Thank Appreciate you. all of the, of the hard work, because it is every year. <laughs> and, and we want to thank all of you for, for making sure that our public knows that their monies have been spent in an appropriate manner fiscally responsible. Thank you so much. Thank you. We have a motion on the floor with a second. Is there any further discussion? Seeing none, Ms. Kirby, would you please take our vote? And with a vote of five yeas, zero nay, we have approved the audits and compliance questionnaire and presentation of the 2023 Annual Comprehensive Financial Report. Thank you very much, board members and th staff. Thank you very much. OK, at this time, it has been suggested that we may want to take a break. Um, and I'm going to remind board members that um, we need to make sure that we're not congregating, that we're only in pairs. Um, but at this time, we are going to take a 10-minute break before we go into the policies. And so at this time, if all you all would be patient with us, um, we've been here since three, so <laughs> we're going to take a we're just going to take a 10-minute break, a little recharge, and we'll be right back in 10 minutes.
Welcome back. There we go. Welcome back to our governing board meeting. Thank you for um, your patience as we took a small break. Um, we're going to do the first reading of policies tonight for policies 5-212 through 5-2019. And these are all on curriculum and instructions. And, and what instruction, sorry. And what we're going to do is this to try to be respectful of everyone's time. Um, as we navigate through the policy adoptions, we want to ensure we are respecting everyone's time. So the first reading of the policies is meant as an introduction and moving forward will be done as a single agenda item. So first, the board will hear the public comments on all of the policies listed in that agenda item. And then the board will proceed to ask questions on policies if they have not already been answered on the Q&A document. If a board member has a question on a policy, we will complete all discussion on that policy before moving on. We would like to remind the public that questions and comments on policy can also be emailed to the governing board. When a person emails me, it really gives me time to think and reflect on the ideas. And I print them off and I read them and it's a much more thoughtful way for me to be able to process thoughts from the community on the decisions that we're making. Public comment is not the only way in which to have your voice heard. Email, I believe, is actually a more effective way. So as we go through the first reading, we have one member of the public that has asked to speak on the first readings of draft policies 5-212 through 5-219. And we have one person, so that person will have three minutes to discuss and ask questions of any of the policies that are in the first reading. And that person is Ms. Sharon Bunsen. Hello, Sharon Benson. So um, I just had a couple of questions. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, for policy 5-212, um, um, that is the policy that is um, discussing non-curricular after-school, I assume, uh, groups. Um, so I didn't notice any procedures. I know in our, our current policy manual, there's usually policy and then procedures uh, separate. So I wanted to know whether or not procedures will be listed separately for that. Will there be criteria for um, what groups can be on campus, uh, what the um, mentor or the um, uh, teacher, I assume there has to, has to be, when I was in school, you had to have a teacher uh, representative or overseeing it. Um, will, if, if a uh, student group is wants to be on campus that or deals with some of the stuff that's not allowed in curriculum, for example, sexuality, 
uh, those kinds of things, will it be required that parents uh, have to be notified and say, hey, I want to be part of this non-curricular club, will that be allowed? I know there are several different um, clubs like that across our high school campuses. Um, but 5 to 12 um, mentioned passing grades. So I want to know whether or not that's going to be clearly defined. Is it actually an F? Because uh, I've heard that an F doesn't really matter anymore uh, and that uh, uh, our mastery level has re been reduced down to 70%. So is that going to be clearly defined? Uh, policy 5 to 17. Um, how is flexible seat time going to be monitored? I'm pretty sure that goes along with the pathways uh, and the uh, the uh, community partnership. So how is that going to be monitored, evaluated, credited uh, to make sure that our kids are actually learning um, things that are important? Uh, 522 or 5220, 5 um, there's just a typo in there. Um, there's 5220 is not in this section. That, that's going to be next meeting. Oh, that's right. That's right. I'm sorry. Uh, pardon me. They have 19? been renumbered. I'm sorry. They okay. have. Well, there's so it's just actually, some... Yeah, in our manual, it's 219. Please go uh, ahead. So it's just my pet peeve when there's um, incorrect grammar. So there's some subject verb disagreement that should be fixed. And um, the use of two, you have T-O-O -O when it should be just the T-O. Um, and then does criteria exist that's going to define what a mentor is. Uh, I think we've heard our parents are concerned and uh, parents have ultimate say over what happens with their kids. So thank you. Okay, at, at this time, um, public comment on the policies, on the first read policies. Um, we've gotten some questions from Ms. Benson. Um, at this time, the board will now proceed to ask questions on policies if they have not already been answered on the Q&A document. My fellow board members, do you have any questions on policies 212 to 219? I have a question. Ms. Walden, please. So on 512, student clubs and activities, so there is a provision in the legislation. It's not spelled out here. Let me pull it up. And it says that uh, it's about students. And I wanted to just check. It's my understanding that, oh, there we go, that I couldn't hear the microphone, um, that students are the ones that initiate clubs and and I don't see that listed listed here and um, let me pull up sorry the legislation or the exemptions there's something about religious clubs that if parents or sorry if, uh, teachers want to participate that they can that they're non participants okay yeah um, ARS 15-720 employees or officers of the school the school district the federal government, the state, or any of the state's political subdivisions may be present at religious meetings only as non-participants. Are we going to extend that to, is, isn't that just all clubs that are, our clubs are student-led and not teacher-led? Yeah, that's my question. Sorry. Okay, we'll add that to the spreadsheet. Thank you. Are there any other questions that board members want to ask at this time that they haven't asked on the spreadsheet? And of course, we can always ask more questions um, later on should they be on your mind. You, you always have access to the Q&A spreadsheet. On the, gradu well, then, yeah, on the graduation document, five dash 217 the seat time flexibility is in blue is that supposed to be a hyperlink and it's just not working is that why it's in blue it's um oh, oh i see okay so it's a change right
Are there any other questions at this time on first read policies 512 to 519? Not at this time. Okay, seeing that there is no further questions or discussion, we'll move to agenda item nine, which is the policies for second read. And second read means that these are actually action items that the board will be taking positions on and we will vote be voting on each of the policies. And to do this, um, in an efficient way and respectful of people's time. What we're going to do is we have um, the spreadsheet of all folks who would like to comment. And what we're going to do is we're going to group those folks. Um, for example, if you signed up for three different policies, say 201, 208, and 209, um, we're going to have you come up as an individual, and you will have two minutes to speak on each item. So if you have signed up for three policies, we're going to have you speak on the three policies at one time, and you will have two minutes to speak on each policy. We good? Okay. So, how, how many people have s signed up to speak? Four. We have. Well, we have um, fourteen people, but some of them are on multiple policies. So we will have some people will have two minutes to speak because they're going to be speaking on one policy. Some people will have four minutes to speak because they're going to speak on two policies, two minutes each, etc. So that's the way this is going to work. This is way. Um, a person gets up once and has their time on all of the policies that they wanted to speak on, and then they're done. Okay, so here we go. With the second reading, public comment. Um, Ms. Sharon Benson has signed up to speak on policy 5201, 5207, and the revision of BDDH. So Ms. Benson, you will have six minutes to speak on each of those policies, two minutes on each one. And we will have the timer up for each policy so you know when your two minutes is up on each policy. Sweet. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> Sharon Benson, again. So 5201. That is the policy that uh, governs the flags and constitution, uh, the Bill of Rights. So um, as I reread it, I'm wondering what is the um, oversight to make sure that uh, grades 7 through 12 actually have a visible copy of the constitution and the Bill of Rights um, visible? I believe it has to be posted near the flag. So I'm uh, curious about that. I haven't been in a high school in a while. So I'm not sure if that's actually happening. I'd also mentioned that um, students can opt out. I'm wondering if students can opt out on their own or, or if, if it's a parent requirement. I think it said a parent requirement. So does, um, are we requiring that parents provide in writing that they don't want their child to participate in the pledge or the um, preamble, the reading of that? Um, I certainly believe that that's their right. I'm wondering if, that, if we're making sure that um, that it that is in fact coming from um, parents and again as this is the policy that covers flags and banners in the classroom uh, we heard earlier tonight um, banners uh, BLM the pride progress flag have no business in a classroom we really need to have a policy I, I would think it would fit nicely in here that we could just say the only flags that are allowed to be in a classroom are the United States flag or the uh, Arizona state flag, because um, I could, I could hang uh, any ideological flag up if, if Black Lives Matter and Pride Pride Girls flags are uh, around. So I, I think we need to 
really honor that. So if we want to truly be inclusive, then we need to be truly inclusive of all viewpoints. Uh, and those two things limit viewpoints. So that's my comments on that. Um, policy 5, 2-07 is curriculum, um, the adoption of it. Uh, under the item number two under purpose says um, that we need to state the purpose and that it cannot, um, no curriculum or policy that we're, no curriculum that we have basically can elevate one racial group over another or ethnic group over another. But all of the resources provided by um, MEA to teachers that belong to the association clearly violated that policy. So uh, they curated, I'll just pull some of them up, um, the 1619 Project, Black Lives Matter in Education, um, and therefore uh, Black Lives Matter at School Week of Action which the NEA was asking for all of their association members to pledge to participate in a year of action. The titles and the uh, subtitles for them. Uh, Mondays was Let the Children March. Now, I think if parents want to raise activists as children, more power to them. That's what America is all about. Teachers do not raise activists. It's not permissible under state statute. Um, diversity, sorry I can't read, this is too small. <laughs> uh, but let's try a little thought, and as Pastor uh, John mentioned earlier, Wednesdays was um, about a transgender child and it was directed to kindergarten through second grade. I can tell you my granddaughter will be out of this district if that is allowed. But let's try a little thought experiment. Um, what if I replaced the word white for? Hold on, I gotta pull up my. The policy regarding public comment. So one of the first lines states, again, and I mentioned this last meeting, uh, which President Hutchinson corrected me, and what well, didn't correct me, but reminded me that our teacher association members are part of our community. However, public comment is supposed to be uh, to um, allow our community members to bring forth anything that is under the purview of the board to guide or direct. Uh, it's really not, I mean, if you want to rewrite policy to say that it can be a cheerleading session or for uh, specific teachers to come up and, and uh, kind of pat themselves on the back or to pat you on the back for any things that you're doing, then I think that would be okay. But again, you have a, an issue with your stakeholder groups regarding transparency and engaging your community. Uh, we see this when public comment time is flooded with, yay, you're doing a great job, um, as a way to water down what your tax paying uh, stakeholders have to say to you. And they pay the salaries in this district. So that's my only comment. Thank you. The next speaker, and he will speak on policy 5201 and 5207, is Ed Steele. And, and Mr. Steele, it's two minutes on each policy. Yep, I think I'll be shorter than that, but thank you. Um, yeah, 501. Uh, 5-201 flag display. Wow, what a good timing. I mean, uh, we just had this discussion, right, earlier? You, you pretty much follow the state statutes. That's great. I appreciate that. Um, U.S. flag, Arizona state flag. Why do you think 
Why do you think that's allowed to fly? Why do you think that's required to fly? Flags are powerful symbols. They're powerful symbols of the greatness of this country. The things that unify us. When you fly a flag other than the United States flag, you're bringing in a different set of values and principles and asking people to be unified under it. There are students in this school district that do not agree with the ideology of the flags you are flying. Now, maybe you guys can twist yourselves in a pretzel and prove to yourselves that you're legally allowed to do that. But like I said earlier, should you do that? The answer is no, obviously. I'm asking you to put one, two simple statements into this flag policy that will eliminate the problem. And here's the statement. The superintendent shall prohibit the display of any flag other than the U.S. flag and the Arizona state flag or any flag used for instructional or proved instructional purposes. This means prohibit all flags of or relating to partisan, political, or social ideology. You put those two statements in there and there are no more problems. that are not approved only allowed to be used for that school year or can they be used each year? And the answer was a little confusing because it referenced the statute which says parents and guardians can object to learning materials and it didn't really answer the question. But what does answer the question is ARS 15721 paragraph D which says if the course includes a basic textbook and uses supplemental books that have not been approved by the governing board at the time of approval of the course, a teacher may use the supplemental books at any time during the school year. Use of the supplemental books shall be brought to the attention of the governing board during the school year in which they are added for ratification. I would prefer to tighten that up a little bit. And here's the statement I would like to see in there. Any supplemental books or materials used for classroom instructions that have not been approved by the board must be brought before the board for approval within 30 days of being introduced into the curriculum. Materials may be used until such a time as the board meets to address the material. You know, the, the way it's written currently in state statute um, unapproved material could be introduced into the classrooms in August and not brought before the board until May. And, and I find that unacceptable. Parents want you to be accountable. They want to know what their students are learning, not six months after the fact. So this would tighten that up, uh, give the district plenty of time to bring that before the board, have it put on an agenda item and approved as properly, as, you know, as it needs to be. Thank you. Our next speaker will speak on 5-201 and 5-209, and that is Chris Hamlet. And Mr. Hamlet, you'll have two minutes on, on each policy. Thank you. So I really like 5-201. It's the first thing I've seen out of this district that I've liked in a long time. And, um, but, but the second paragraph under U.S. flag... It, it, it's a little obscure. I, I, I mean, if you go down to a period of silence, I'm not sure where we change it from moment of silence to period of silence, but if you go down to that, I want to read that. A period of silence shall be observed at the beginning of the day. The teacher in charge of the room shall announce that a period of silence for at least one minute, but not more than two minutes, will be observed. During that time, no activity shall take place and, and silence shall be maintained. That is very crystal clear. And I would like you to maybe look at that wording and look at the second paragraph um, on, under the flag display. The district shall set aside a specific time each day 
for students who wish to recite the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag. Now, how do you find out which ones wish to and which ones don't? Why don't you, I'm, I'm asking that you change the language on this second paragraph to, to almost emulate what you have under period of silence. Make it part of the beginning of the day. Make it part of the structure. We all grew up in that structure. Everybody up on this board is old enough to remember that structure where the Pledge of Allegiance moment of silence was the beginning of the day every day. And I agree with what some others said. The oversight has, somebody has got to take charge of the oversight because Taylor Junior High, when my kids were going through it, one day a week, if that, would they do the pledge, period, one day a week? So I, I really like what you got going on here. I just think that you need to add, um, you need to make district or, or paragraph two under the flag display just as clear as the period of silence. And maybe even, you know, just add them both together. Put them in there, this the same that we all grew up with. Moment of silence, pledge, now we start our day. Um, I'm, I'm done with that. We can go to the second one. Start the clock on the second one if you want. Well, don't start just until I find my paper. <laughs> oh nine. So I see we're still we're still back to what it was originally. I mean, what I said last time didn't hold any weight, but the district shall exclude from school libraries all books, publications, and papers of a sectarian, partisan, or denominational character, except where permitted under law. And here again, now that I mean we can, we can actually speak instead of just ask questions, I guess, and perform everything in, in, in the form of a question like attorneys, like we were told to last time. So now that we can speak, I wanna, I wanna make this clear again. This, this junk is in Mesa High School Library. This is volume three of four, four volumes called Heartstopper. And I told you guys, volume one starts with two, two gay children making out in a library, ironically, and one of them is in the closet. Okay, and he is abusive until his other friend comes and, and, and saves him later on. Um, this it's it's riddled with with foul language, holding hands, kissing. Um, it, it is this is actually designed for grooming, indoctrination, and hypersexualization all at once. Who's your target audience when you can read a two hundred page book in like thirty minutes because it's all in comic book format? You know, they're targeting children with these. So when when you have exclude from school libraries, all books, publications of religious and, and, and um, uh, political nature, why, why would we allow this? Why would we allow trash that teaches children? What, what, what are they learning from this? With the foul language too, who's, who's gonna oversee this? And this is why I caution you on giving all the power to Superintendent Forless and you guys have some kind, this board needs to have some kind of oversight in the public square on, on, on what is allowed to be excluded. And I mean, if you're, you're, you're actually excluding stuff that's educational, you know, re learning about religion and learning about politics. And I guess that's the whole point, keep them dumb, right? But you're, you're allowing this trash in. Who's the overseer? I think you guys really need to reword this and really have some oversight over superintendency when it comes to what can be allowed in the library. Our next speaker will be on policy 5-209 and Anne-Marie Howard. And Ms. Howard, you'll have two minutes. Thank you. My name is Anne-Marie Howard. I'm a proud employee of Mesa Public Schools. I was once a student many years ago for Mesa Public Schools. My children attended Mesa Public Schools and I have three grandchildren in Mesa Public Schools. I ran an elementary library for the last 17 years. I have seen how reading is the gateway to most successes in life. I used to challenge my students to name one life skill or career that they could have that didn't require good literacy skills and they couldn't do it until that one student tried to stump me. And there's always that one student. He said that you wouldn't need good reading skills if you became a lemon squeezer. <laughs> and I stumped him back by asking, how are you getting to this exotic job? Are you driving? That requires reading skills. Are you riding the metro? That requires reading skills. Um, if you were to happen to get lemon juice in your eye and needed to render yourself first aid, I would hope that you had read ahead of time on how to do that. If we believe in the mission statement of Mesa Public Schools <coughs> to serve every student by strength, need, and prepares, prepare these graduates ready for college, career, and community, 
then we must absolutely invest in our libraries, and I'm here to support the libraries. We must allow for diverse collections that serve all our students' strengths and needs. When I had a student who said they didn't like to read, and it was actually more than one, this happens over the years, I took that to mean we just hadn't found the right book for them yet. That's the beautiful thing about libraries, there's so many choices. For our students who need medical attention, we don't withhold access to the health office. For our students with special needs, we make sure to provide the proper support, including assistive technology. Providing a diverse array of books in our libraries isn't any different than those other supports we use. Books are windows into the world we live in. They help us make connections to people whose lives are different than our own. Our next speaker will also speak on 5-209, and that is Lisa Olson. Madam President and members of the board and community members, I'm here to speak um, in favor of number 5-209. I'm a former educator for Mesa Public Schools and my five children attended Mesa Public Schools. I'm a proud public school supporter and it is a family tradition. So I recognize that our citizens, all of the residents of Mesa have the opportunity to go to public school, which means we have to provide a space for all of them. I think your mission statement is beautiful to recognize every child by name and to make sure we are serving each child appropriately. Uh, so with that, I wanna say that every child deserves to be seen, heard, and valued in our community and especially in our schools. And if they are not represented in the curriculum, in the books and discussions, then the message that they don't belong rings loud and clear to them. They feel that and it hurts. We have been actively erasing people from history for hundreds of years, and only now are we making inroads in including historical figures that are people of color, our LGBTQ people who have made a big impact on this country, have fought for policy and change through activist mechanisms, changing policies, procedures, and law. And it's good we're doing that because then these children can see themselves in that material. I don't need to tell you what the suicide rates are when people don't feel valued and loved and like they belong. They make difficult decisions about their lives. I am asking you to please keep moving forward and providing learning opportunities for all of our children as this is a big country and it's a big tent. Thank you for all you do. The next speaker will also speak on 5-209, and this is Nicole Gutierrez-Miller. Maybe the hour was too late. Okay. Um, our next speaker will be on 5-209, as well as the revision of policy BDDH, Josh Chilton. Good evening. Um, first off, I want to compliment the speakers prior, um, our, our value librarians. The um, reason why I wanted to speak on 5-209 is um, <laughs> tell a little story. I went last week to pick up my daughter at Explorer, um, and uh, I was a little early. She was still working on her homework. And she grabs my hand and she says, hey, I need to show you this. I need to show you this. Takes me over to a desk, and she's got her notebook and six books that she picked up at the library <laughs> that day, all laid out in front of her. And she was so excited to, to get them home and start reading. She started telling me, I mean, she's been reading for years. Um, ever since she was little, she was reading Fancy Nancy and The Princess in Black. Uh, her favorite book is Tale of Despero. 
Um, right now she's reading something called, I heard this yesterday because before bed she had to tell me every plot point in The Land of Stories, which apparently is great about the, the evil queen from uh, uh, Snow White. But in any case, very, very rarely has she ever brought home a book that I've disagreed with in any way. You know, uh, whether she's gone from the public school library or another. Um, the only one that comes close is Junie B. Jones. If you know Junie B. Jones, it, it's, it's a very popular series, but she is a rude, spoiled little girl. <laughs> and so what do I do as a parent? I talk to my daughter and I ask her, is this pr proper behavior for a child? Is this how you should act to your parents? She goes, no. I said, that's right. Do I think that Junie B. Jones should be taken out of schools? No, not at all. Instead, I encourage every parent to talk to their students, find out what they're reading, find out what they're learning, find out what they think about this, and talk to them. Um, you know, parents should be able to raise their children as they want. I agree with that. But to take any items away from... Revision of the BDDH. I've been coming to these meetings for a couple months now, um, and I, I honestly, truly enjoy them. Um, I learned so much, especially from the presentations, uh, which are way later than they probably should be. Um, but I've heard so much from Dr. Strom and uh, so much data, which again, I've told you to your face, I really appreciate. Um, and I've also been on public... Uh, um, during calls to the public, other times. I value opinions even if I don't agree with them. Days like today when there's differing opinions on the left side and the right side and, and all over, that's what this country, that's what this city is founded upon. And I respect the right for anybody to do that. The fact that these revisions are going to give parents, community members, more opportunities to speak and be heard, um, I strongly support. Um, at the same time, I also hope that not only are parents asking questions, but they're also being responded to as well. Um, last week, uh, or I believe it was last week, you know, people could ask questions, but they weren't necessarily going on to the spreadsheet and being answered. Um, part of listening is also responding, and, and um, you know, I hope that I understand that the bylaws say that you can't respond to me or, or vice versa afterwards. Um, but having these opportunities, I think, are a step in the right direction. So I hope we continue to have these conversations um, so that we can weigh all opinions equally. And uh, in the end, doesn't it all come down to doing the best job we can for our kids? So thank you guys very much for your time. Appreciate it. Our next speaker will be also speaking on 5209, and it's Sarah Chanis. Sarah, I'm hoping I pronounced your last. Oh, good. Okay, thank you. All right. My name is Sarah Chanis. I have been the librarian at Kerr Center for AgriScience for three years. Additionally, I am completing my master's in library science with a school media endorsement. According to the American Library Association, in building collections, library staff is guided by principles of selection rather than censorship. This proposed change begins with the word exclude and eliminates the specific attributes of a successful library collection. Tonight, I ask that you articulate why you're proposing to remove the current policy. How do materials that enrich support the curriculum, taking into consideration the varied interest, abilities, and maturity level of the students serve, fail to align with district interest. Is that not equivalent to the uh, mission of Mesa Public Schools? Where does stimulating growth in factual knowledge, literary appreciation, aesthetic values, and ethical standards deviate from district values? You can find all of those components on the portrait of a graduate. Why should we not provide a background of information that shall enable students to make intelligent judgments in their daily lives? Don't students recognize themselves in materials representative of the many religious, ethnic, and cultural groups and the contributions to our American heritage 
and our school district. Doesn't assuring a comprehensive collection appropriate for the users of the library support the five strategic goals of Mesa Public Schools? Most importantly, how does the proposed policy, the new policy, supersede this last item? Provide a current balanced collection of books, basic reference materials, text, periodicals, and audiovisual materials that depict in an accurate and unbiased way the cultural diversity and pluralistic nature of American society. This statement clearly defines what the new policy leaves vague, with, which provides better guidance for decision makers at all levels. Please retain these crucial elements of the existing policy so that we may fully serve every bright, beautiful soul in Mesa Public Schools. Our next speaker will speak on 5209, and that is Angela Gomez. Hello, um, I'm Angela Gomez. I am a community member and I've also been interning in Mesa Public Schools for the past four years, pursuing my degree in secondary education. I've been at over three schools and I've participated in over 100 hours in sixth through eighth grade classrooms. Um, and this is a time when students are becoming themselves and becoming understanding who they are and they're starting to become independent and really think for themselves and kind of draw away from what they've been you know, doing since they were born. Um, and students are really able to find themselves through reading and through finding materials that reflect their individual cultures, their identities, and gives them ideas beyond what they've experienced themselves already. And this doesn't mean anything crazy. <laughs> it, it really doesn't. Students go to read when they're done with their assignments. They go to classroom libraries. They have something that they got at the library already. And that's nothing wrong. We should be encouraging reading no matter what it is. Um, I'm speaking as someone who's aspiring to be a science teacher. And while you may not think that it has a lot of reading, it has a lot of reading. And like I said, students love to read when they're done with their assignments in class. Classroom libraries and school libraries are very crucial for a child's development, no matter what subject or what area in the school they are in. Thank you. Our next speaker is on policy 5209 and Lupita Bustos. I guess it's it, it would be Christina, <laughs> not Lupita. Hi. Um, yeah, so I'm very concerned about the word exclude um, in the policy. I know this is a second reading. Um, I want to add that Black Lives Matter, and I'm grateful for the land acknowledgement that we have here in our office or in our boardroom, and Trans Lives Matter, and... Palestinian kids matter, Jewish kids matter, Christian, Catholic, LDS communities, they all matter. And they deserve to be represented in books. They deserve to be represented in books that are in our libraries, which we do have a Bible in our library somewhere. Um, I would like to just... Um, let you know that as a kid, the library was my safe place. And I was one of the people that was allowed to put the plastic covering on them to protect them. Um, that was a very esteemed job. Um, I'm concerned when student choice will be curtailed by the words exclusion. Um, it's horrific when my own child is scared to be in a room where there's a teacher that doesn't support them. And uh, why am I not seen as a parent? Because I am a parent that cares about her black kid, her brown kid in a classroom. I'm tired of parents standing up in these board meetings and telling you that we don't want to speak up, because we do, and I'm speaking up. George and Harold, 
Captain Underpants. That concludes public comment on the second readings. And so what we're going to do at this time is to, with each policy, we'll take a motion, a second, we'll begin board discussion, and ultimately vote on the policy. And we'll do these in order. And we are doing policies 5-201 through 5-211. And our last policy that we'll take a look at is BDDH. These are all second reads. These are action items. So at this time, is there a motion to approve draft policy 5-201 flag display US Constitution Bill of Rights Moment of Silence Declaration of Independence? So moved. Ms. Davis has moved. Is there a second? Second. Ms. Sears has seconded. It's been moved and seconded to approve Policy 5-201, is there board discussion? Yes, oh, Ms. Walden, sorry. So I have a couple of questions on the policy. One is, does the, in the second paragraph, the district shall set aside a time for students who wish to recite the pledge. Is that in the legal language or is that our wording? That's from, that's from statute. The statute says for students who wish to recite the pledge? Yes. Okay, so I just want to make sure I heard you. Mm -hmm. And then the other question I have is, and I, and I do like this policy, I echo the public comment, uh, and I, you know, I think our previous policy didn't have all this spelled out about the law, but with, with the flag display, and our, and our law says these are the flags that we have, then why can't we just add to our policy and, and just c confirm that we this is what we have in our, in our classrooms and this is it and this represents everybody. Instead of, uh, we had in the earlier public comment, we had a parent that was very supportive of the district that said that accused parents of pushing ideology and agendas, which I thought was really ironic because she was on the side that wants to display pride flags, but on the flip side, doesn't that also promote an ideology and agenda? And we should just stay neutral and follow the state statute and have our U.S. flag display. And then for the 7th through 12, as the law says, the U.S. Constitution and the Bill of Rights. Any other questions or comments? Just yes, Ms. Davis. I did like the idea um, that Mr. Hamlet did bring up about the period of silence and the flag display. I know it's just like displaying as far as like reading it. If we flip, if you put the period of silence, it would just be merely a, a looks a, for making it, you know, flow in order as, as it, the flag display and the period of, of silence together, that it would flow together. Um, I do appreciate that our kids do this. Every, every day. So am I the only one that has comment on pride flags and BLM flags in the classroom? I'm not seeing anyone else that does. Superintendency, are you not willing to have a discussion and concede that pushing ideology and agenda divides the district and is part of your declining enrollment in this district? Ms. Walden, you're you're always welcome to offer an amendment. I mean, you as a, you have a right as a board member to offer an amendment. And if you'd like to do that, this would be the time to do I, it. I would like to do that, and I appreciate that, Madam President. And I think I was hesitant to offer an amendment because it, it's something that I fear if no one's willing to talk about it or 
that it's just going to fail. So uh, I will, I'd like to amend the, uh, sorry, I've never offered an amendment, so if you could please help me out with the language. Uh, do I make a proposal to add an amendment? Is that how that works? You move to amend, yes. Okay, so I make a motion uh, to amend the policy 5-201. Then does, does it need you have to state what your amendment is? You have to have your language right. Uh, you have to have language that exactly that you what you'd like to add to the policy. Okay, so the language that I would like to add to the policy uh, under that the that the flag display uh, in the U.S. flag, and then I think the law also says the Arizona flag. They're allowed to be displayed in the classroom, with the exception of world history classes that's defined in statute, where in world history or other history classes, they have exceptions to fly or present flags from other countries. And we can work on that language to match. They have to have that language exactly right now. Well, we could yep. We could postpone or we can remove the, um, the motion to vote on this so we can get the language right to cover Arizona revised statutes that talk about the Arizona flag and the American flag, and then that says the exceptions for flying other countries' flags, and then we can get the language right and vote on it next next time. I mean, these policies- That is, if that is the wish of the board, sure. Okay. Sure, no problem. Thank you for your help. You bet. Are you are you going to make an amendment or, yes, or not? Yes, Okay. So I move, let's see, to, to well, to postpone the vote, are we because we already have a motion to vote on it. So, do we withdraw the do we withdraw the motion? No, we don't withdraw the motion unless the maker of the motion would like to withdraw. Okay, so then I make a, a motion to. You, you cannot make a motion when another motion is already on the floor. Okay. We never you can, like you we can never amend. use Robert's rules in here, like in terms of commenting. We ask you to question. And you know, usually it's like, okay, point of privilege, point of information. We don't ever use I'm, that, so I'm just we're a just using rusty the on common the procedure rules. that if okay. you want to if you want to make an amendment, you have the language, and we men we amend. Well, so, if I don't, if the language isn't right, then I don't think we should make the amendment tonight because I don't think we're ready to get the language right. So we could just postpone the. The vote on it to get the language right and vote on it another time. I feel like this warrants further discussion. We didn't have discussion on it the first time. We were only allowed to ask questions the, when we read this through the first draft, and now it's time to have the discussion, but we can't really have a discussion because we're going to vote on it, which is why I think... As our parliamentarian, I do not believe that we can postpone a vote if we've got a motion on the floor. Um, at this time, you should uh, move forward with the motion on the floor or an amendment to that motion. That, that's the way I understand it as well. Okay, if then the motion dies, then then you can consider another motion or bring it back at another time. That is correct. So we can always move. We've, we've got a motion on the floor to accept the policy, to adopt the policy, and we can vote on that motion, and if most of the board members don't want to do it at this time, they would vote no. That would be the, that would be the will of the board. Yes, Ms. Davis. Question, could it be that you we vote on this policy, and could Ms. Walden bring forth a new policy on the other flag? That could be, that could be an option. That could be, that could be an option. If you um, could bring a, a, um, a policy and, and I would advise, you know, that it be written out and so that we could take a look at it. That could be an option, um, later on. Not, not, I mean, that's what, that's how we do policy. You know, we write it up and we propose it and, 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 and it's voted on. So that is an option that you could have sure, later yeah, on. You wouldn't necessarily have to amend it right now. No. And, and I've tried to have policies introduced that haven't been introduced. So I don't think I'm going to respectfully go that route because it hasn't worked out for me in the last 15 months. So uh, I'll just make an amendment then that my amendment would say that uh, the classrooms will have the display the United States flag and the Arizona state flag as defined by law except in the exception of 
history classes that allow flags from other countries as defined by law. Ms. Kirby, are, were you able to get that in, in typed in a sentence form? So as an amendment form, I'm sorry. A motion um, to amend draft policy 5 201 uh, to reflect that the option display should be in the US flag and the Arizona flag only meets the exception um, allowed by law. So that uh, for, for history classes that allow flags of other countries. Because there are, and I'll have to pull up the, I mean, I can pull up the revised statutes. I just don't want to, I, I think we can flesh that out. But it, when Casey King can add the revised statutes to it, but uh, it's there's in the law that for history classes, there's exceptions in flying and displaying flags from other countries. Okay, so history. the problem is we need exact language because then this is policy. So it would be really helpful if we had exact language. Um, so I, I hear what you're saying, but we want to make sure we have the exact language so that all the board knows what we're voting on. Okay, do you want me to look it up? I, or should I, we just, we can just table this and then come back to it. And again, we could have, you could do it, you could write a policy. That you're always welcome to do that. Yes, and to, yes, and, to and it's this. not going to be heard and it's not going to be placed on it, the agenda. If I had ever gotten a policy in writing and it had been suggested by a board member, it would be heard. I and sent I, you two policies to be placed on the agenda. I don't, I'm, I'm not aware that two policies have been sent. I've got two newspaper articles, but I've never gotten written policy. And so that's what has to be done because we want to make sure, and this is why we're doing it this way, we have to have exact language because if it becomes policy, then it's the rule of the district. So it's very important that the language is precise. And if you, if really, if you want to propose the policy, write it out, we'll put it on the agenda. That's, that's the way it's done. I'd be happy to do it. So, all right, I, I'm, I mean, I'm just, like I said, if, if, if the track record doesn't give me hope or, or trust that that's going to happen, uh, I, I, can, I, can add, I can add the language right now, and, and, but like you said, it's, you know, I, 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 I would like Unfortunately, it to Unfortunately, we're, we're, we're ready to proceed. This is the second reading. This is for the vote. Yeah, because we couldn't have a discussion last time. This is something we should have had in the discussion. When we have a first policy, Point of we order. should be having a discussion about it. Otherwise, we're order. sitting here scrambling to write amendments when I could have had an amendment done and prepared. That is correct. We could have had the discussion that is, that in the first meeting. That is absolutely meeting, correct. To which have has an always amendment. been the practice of this board, is that we have a discussion in the first read of a policy prior to voting on it. So yeah, I don't have an amendment prepared because I was ready to have a discussion. I don't think that just because it's a second reading, we have to vote on it. These policies are not effective until July 1. So we have months to okay, get this right. This is the will of the board. We have a motion on the sure. floor. I withdraw my amendment. Okay, That's fine. thank you. At this time, is there any other discussion by board members? Yes, Dr. O'Reilly. I would like to encourage Member Walden to submit something because I'd like to see it and have some discussion about it. Terrific. Thank you. I, I will do that. Agree. And, and agreed. Okay. Super. Okay. So we're back to our original motion and that is to um, adopt policy 5-201. Mr. Hamlet, please do not make comments. That is, we, we said that that's disruptive. Please don't. I would, I would really ask you to be respectful of the board. Thank you. Sir, I can, I'm, I'm, I'm done. I'm done. Thank you. Um, Ms. Kirby, would you please um, take our vote, seeing that there is no further discussion?
I vote aye that I have lost connection here. With a vote of four yay and one nay, we have passed policy 5-201. Um, the motion in the second is incorrect. The, with the motion to vote the second, I didn't second it. That is correct. The motion was made, thank you for the correction, the motion was made by Ms. Davis and it was seconded by Mrs. Sears. Thank you, my yes. Let's go to policy 5-202, Students with Disabilities, Section 504, the Rehabilitation Act of 73. Is there a motion to approve draft policy 5-202? So moved. Mrs. Sears has moved. Is there a second? Second. Ms. Davis has seconded. It's been moved and seconded to approve draft policy 5-202. Is there any discussion? Seeing that there is no discussion, Ms. Kirby, would you please take our vote? I got it. I got it. Yep. With a vote of five yay and zero nay, you have passed 5 202. Let's go to the third policy reading, and that is 5 203 Students with Disabilities, Individuals with Disabilities Education Act. Do I have a motion to approve the draft policy 5 203? So moved. Ms. Davis has moved. Is there a second? Second. Mrs. Sears has seconded. It's been moved and seconded to approve draft policy 5-203. Is there any discussion? Seeing no discussion, Ms. Kirby, would you please take our vote? With a vote of 5 yay, 0 nay, we have passed 5 203. Let's go to 5 204. Is there a motion to approve draft policy 5 204, Students with Disabilities Procedural Safeguards? So moved. Ms. Davis has moved. Is there a second? Second. Mrs. Sears has seconded. It's been moved and seconded to approve draft policy 5 204. Is there any discussion? Seeing that there is no discussion, Ms. Kirby, would you please take our vote? With a vote of five yay, zero nay, we have passed policy 5-204. On to policy 5-205. Is there a motion to approve policy 5-205, gifted education programs and services? So moved. Ms. Davis has moved. Is there a second? 
second. Ms. Sears has seconded. It's been moved and seconded to approve draft policy 5-205. Is there any board discussion? Yes, Madam Chair, I would like to um, speak to this um, policy. I just want to say that I'm especially grateful with the inclusion of students with disabilities as it comes to inclusion of them with gifted and talented, because I know at times that's been very separate and not recognizing um, that both um, abilities uh, can go parallel. So I just wanted to say acknowledgement and I appreciate the policy is thoughtful uh, and is doing both. Thank you, Mrs. Sears. Is there any more discussion? Seeing that there is no more discussion, Ms. Kirby, would you please take our vote? Five dash two oh five has passed with a vote of five yay and zero nay. Let's go on to policy five dash two oh six. Is there a motion to approve policy five dash two oh six English instruction? So moved. Ms. Davis has moved. Is there a second? I will second. Dr. O'Reilly has seconded. It's been moved and seconded to approve draft policy 5-206. Is there any board discussion? Yes, um, Madam um, President, as I look at this policy, I'm um, understanding uh, part of its intent, and I do speak to um, the ARS um, 15 753 that actually, um, as we look at our dual language speakers and um, non English speakers, and knowing that this district is setting the precedence to make sure that all students are learning and included no matter what their native language is. Thank you, Mrs. Sears. Is there any other board discussion? Seeing, oh, sorry, Mrs. Walden. What classifies as instruction? I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. Where, where are you in the, in the policy? The, the English, English instruction two hundred six. Right, but we're, we're in the context of the policy. Are you? Uh, the, is there, a, it says English instruction, 5-206 English instruction. Does that, is that just what's defined in the Arizona revised statute? Is this just adopted right out of the law? Yes, this is the current legislation. I think the intent of, um, the word instruction and taught are synonyms. Does the does it specify in all of these revised statutes that like everybody has to be is it, is it go into that detail that everybody has to be speaking English? Does that include teacher aides too? So instruction first best instruction in the classroom. Um, we are mandated to teach in English, and that's by our certificated teachers. However, our students, for example, who may be learning English as a second language, um, there are different models that have been approved by the the state board of education. And so there's different supports depending on those individual students and their needs. Okay. But, but our instruction needs to be in um, in English. And that's just that's all the that's all specified in the revised statutes. So we're not doing anything different than what the law says. Right. We do the we follow the state board adopted models. Okay. Thank you. Is there any further discussion? 
seeing that there is none, Ms. Kirby, would you please take our vote? With a vote of five yay, zero nay, we have passed policy 5-206. We're on to policy 5-207, curriculum adoption. Is there a motion to approve the policy, draft policy 5-207, curriculum adoption? So moved. Mrs. Davis has moved. Is there a second? I'll second. Dr. O'Reilly has seconded. It's been moved and seconded to approve draft policy 5-207. Is there any board discussion? Yes, Madam Chair. I am um, Ma Madam President. As I look at this pol policy and um, curriculum adoption, I um, say that I'm every very proud and a proud American and as a um, when you look at individuality, yes, we all are proud Americans, no matter what our ethnicity is and our unique experience. So when I look at this policy, I believe I we work toward um, seeing the humanity of all and celebrating the heritage of all of our students that, at teach, that attend Mesa Public Schools. Thank you, Mrs. Sears. Further discussion, Dr. O'Reilly. I have a question. Because uh, it was raised earlier about it's not approved and they can use it in the classroom. Like, when does that end? And I looked at the, the law, and I'm on the second page, just before yeah. curriculum adoption for 912. It, it says, use of the supplemental books shall be brought to the attention of the board during the school year in which they are added for ratification, not when they're used in the classroom. So I don't understand, that wording doesn't make any sense to me. So like, we'll only approve it when it comes to us for ratification, and that doesn't, that doesn't make sense in my mind, so I'm just asking for a clarification. I'm still trying to figure out where you're at. Yeah, on the Which second page. Second page. I believe it's this one. Yeah. Is that, or is it there, that, right there. This one. So it's okay. Use of the supplemental books shall be brought to the attention of the board during the school year in which they are added for ratification. Okay. It's curriculum adoption K eight one two three four five fifth the paragraph. sixth paragraph the sixth down paragraph. last sentence. So if I might talk a little bit about the process. Thank you very um, much. We have a curriculum adoption process for uh, curriculum instructional resources and. When we bring, um, when we are looking to, for example, if the standards are updated and we need to update our curriculum, and sometimes then that will also require a set of resources to be attached to that curriculum. Um, right now, we have, for example, the way that the, the legislation defines textbook, it is a textbook that is aligned to a course or a subject. and. If a course or a subject then doesn't have an adopted textbook, then we go to supplemental materials. And so, for example, um, our process, we in the past have adopted most recently for our ELA in, in the elementary, K-5 Scholastic is our adopted resources. We brought forth um, foundations as supplemental resources to make sure we had a well-rounded program. Throughout that process, we in Mesa Public Schools, our adoption process is that we um, go out for a request for proposal, an RFP. It triggers um, vendors to submit based on criteria that uh, we put together based on evidence, based on research, based on community input, et cetera. And then we have a 60-day public review for that process. We bring that to the board. Um, most recently, last year, I think it was, we had the 612 social studies adoption the um, information that was provided throughout all of our listening sessions and research and all those kinds of things suggested that one textbook was not going to cut it. And so therefore, the RFP, most districts don't 
go out for an RFP, but in Mesa Public Schools, our process is that we do. And so we put on an RFP with the criteria we were looking for, for sixth through um, 12th grade. That provided uh, responses from vendors to um, submit based on that criteria and our committees uh, put together what they felt would be a bundle of resources. And then again, those triggered um, some discussion, some vetting, 60-day public review, and we brought those to the board for adoption as well. So the new legislation is saying um, all textbooks have to be brought to the board for approval when it's aligned to a course or a subject. If it doesn't have that textbook adoption, then we would look at supplemental materials. In Mesa Public Schools, we would go through that same process, RFP, review, 60-day public review, bring it to the board for adoption. In this case, what they're saying is, um, for example, sometimes in um, an English course, let's say, a teacher finds a program that may be, um, may be better suited to the needs of their classroom. Maybe it has additional uh, tier two resources that they want to use in small group instruction, or they find something that has more inquiry-based for project-based learning and so forth. And so if that teacher is wanting to use that and use that over and over and over again, to me, that would be aligned to that subject or that course. And therefore, um, we would want to make sure that a committee is formed to vet that, make sure it fits the criteria, et cetera. Um, and then we would bring that to the board for approval if it's something that we felt was aligned to, to what we were looking for in the instruction. And that would be that ratification to say, here's what the teacher's been using, we've got some data, it aligns to what our vision is and um, the state standards, et cetera, and so we want to bring that to you for approval. That may happen at the beginning of the year, it may happen at the end of the year, it just it kind of depends sometimes when, when that is brought and introduced into the classroom. And so we would be looking at procedures, formerly known as regulations, um, that we would be putting together based on that process, and we have a design team working on that right now. Okay, so that will be addressed in the procedures. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Great. And for clarification, that's a departure from what we currently do. That would be in addition to. In addition. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Good question. Thank you, Dr. O'Reilly. Is there any other questions? Is the, Walden? Yes, is this the only curriculum policy that we're going to see? Are, are there other curriculum policies that will be used in conjunction with this, or is this the curriculum policy? This is the adoption of curriculum uh, materials, resources, documents, et cetera. We also do, though, in Mesa Public Schools, have the, the CCAP, which is the board-appointed community um, advisory panel that we bring forth our curriculum um, for recommendation for approval to the, to the board. And then it was brought up in the public comment about a 30 days to approve the supplemental material. Is that something that's in the, that's in the procedures? Um, we can certainly look at what that timeline looks like based on your input. Um, I would say that 30 days might be a little tricky just because we want to make sure that it's appropriately vetted with a design team, um, that we've got some data to support and those kinds of things. So that might be a little bit a little bit slim of a timeline. Okay, well, I was just, in the public comment, it was mentioned that, you know, like a something could, a supplemental material could be introduced, but it may not get to the board till like the end of the year. And so if, in terms of tightening that up, and that's probably just broad language, mm -hmm. but in setting a, a tighter time frame for us, do we need to do that in policy or is that able to be done in procedure? Um, I think it could be done in procedure and thinking about also, this is talking about what are the adopted district resources aligned to a course or subject. And so, um, again, in Mesa Public Schools, our adoption process follows the same method for what's an approved adopted textbook and then, and or if it doesn't have the textbook, we already bring to the board for approval, what are the adopted supplemental resources. So there's really not a change there in that in that manner, but as far as timeline and those kinds of things, we could certainly put that into the procedures. And then, where did we address teachers bringing in outside materials? And there, you know, maybe there's a video they want to show, and and I've seen like syllabuses that have different materials on them that aren't part of like our approved curriculum or supplemental mat material, or even what was because it was brought up in public comments and the things that went on 
in February 1619 project. That's not part of our supplemental material. So where is that addressed that, that what teachers bring into the classroom? Yeah, so if a teacher is bringing in resources and they are utilizing it over time ongoing, to align to their course, for example, we'll say in a high school course, and they're, they've got this unit that they've created and it's got these videos or something like that that they're using all of the time, that would definitely be something that we would now make sure that um, we would bring that to the board for ratification. Sometimes teachers will just pull a video or something, you know, a clip from, for example, a YouTube video, and that would be something that is should be in their lesson plans, the principal oversees the lesson plans, the department chairs and the teams. Um, and if there was a, a challenge to that or a consideration that a, a parent didn't want their child to participate in that, that goes back to um, the chapter one policies in terms of parental rights. And then there's a procedure for um, following up the principal and writing and those kinds of things in terms of, of what their concern is. And uh, children can be opted out, students can be opted out from those lessons. So. So the principals approve, approve all lesson plans. So if there's additional material going in, then the principal approves it? Is it? The principal oversees the instruction that's happening in the classroom, yes. So is it safe to assume that if the teachers are, are teaching something like 1619, which scholars and academics have bunked as categorically false history of America, that we would take that up with the, the principal? That is correct. And then... But, but that, is that like an academic freedom that is not addressed in the, in the law? It's not the authority of the board? So we don't have an academic freedom policy. You typically see that in um, secondary education, that academic freedom for professors, et cetera. Um, but there is legislation around prohibited instruction, and then the legislation clearly outlines what teachers um, can or cannot do in terms of prohibited instruction. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Any other further discussion? Seeing that there is none, Ms. Kirby, would you please take our vote? No, it's not coming up, Ms. Kirby. Everybody thinks it's them. <laughs> Can we do it by voice vote? All those in favor? There it is. Oh. Sorry, the marking out. Not yet. There it is. Okay. Good. We got it. That's right. Um, with a vote of four yay, one nay, we have passed policy 5 207. At this point, we'll take a look at Draft Policy 5-208, Availability of and Access to Instructional Materials and Activities. Is there a motion to approve Draft Policy 5-208, Availability of and Access to Instructional Materials and Activities? Bless you. Is there a motion? So moved. Ms. Davis has moved. Is there a second? Second. Ms. Sears has seconded. It's been moved and seconded to approve draft policy 5-208. Is there any board discussion? Appears to be no discussion. Ms. Kirby, would you please take our vote?
With a vote of five yeas, zero nay, we have passed policy 5-208. We're on to policy 5-209. Is there a motion to approve draft policy 5-209, school libraries, media, and resource centers? So moved. Mrs. Davis has moved. Is there a second? I will second. Dr. O'Reilly seconds. It's been moved and seconded to approve draft, draft policy 5-209. Is there any discussion by the board? Madam President, I have um, two questions um, regarding this, and please excuse me for, um, I've actually pondered this quite a bit. As I looked at the, um, the district shall, the second one, exclude uh, library, uh, all books, publications, and papers of sectarian, partisan, or denomination character, except where permitted under the law. And definitely, I've internalized the permitted under law um, part. I have a question. Um, you see, is, uh, Mrs. King, is that, is that particular statement, is that exactly how it comes out of the state statute? I be without looking at the statute, I can tell you that I've read it enough times to know that if that's not an exact um, replica of the statute, it is extremely close. This is, these are the types of books that are required to be excluded. So if I'm understanding you correctly, um, that where it discusses the um, that what the district shall do enforcing rules prescribed for school libraries, the um, exclusion um, bullet allowing students of suitable age to use the facility free of charge and developing policies regarding the use of the facility. Those are state that state statute. Those yes. four bullet points. Yes. Thank you very much. And if I can go back to Mrs. Sears. The language from the first sentence is directly, the, the, except permitted by statute is the only thing that um, does not come directly from the statute because um, the statute go, goes back to what would be permitted under a, a different statute. Those would be classes typically um, on religion, like a world religion class. I might add that 15-362, um, number two, the languages mm -hmm. exclude from school libraries all books, publications, and papers of a sectarian, partisan, or denominational character. This paragraph does not prohibit any materials for the elective course permitted by section 15-717.01. So it's pretty close. Is there any further discussion? Yeah, so, um, you go, go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, okay. Ms. Walden, would you like to continue? Well, so you know, we've had a lot of comments from librarians because the old policy had a lot more information than this one. And so I just wanted to comment that this policy doesn't exclude classic literature or books of different cultures and ethnicities and diverse backgrounds is just saying that this is the law that we follow, would it be procedures that then maybe might explain or mirror what the old policy looked like and in going into those details? Yes, that's exactly right. So uh, formerly we've had some procedures that were internally developed by our, resource, our district um, library specialist in conjunction with our, our school um, resource specialists. And so they have worked to create some procedures um, for your review as well. And I think one of our community speakers mentioned it perfectly. It's all about the selection process versus censorship. And um, so they've used a lot of resources such as the American Library Association and other um, resources to develop how to best select those resources. And so we would certainly want to include um, a, di a diverse collection of, of books that represent our community in the library. 
so my concern with the policy, though, is that when it's like part of procedure, is that the board doesn't have any control over that. Like this is a sort of generic policy. What's our process of giving input on on the pr procedures? Because like I I love literature. I love classic literature, and I know even some classic literature can be controversial. My my concern, and I've heard from the community, and because nobody's trying to quash diverse literature things that represent different backgrounds it's the sexually explicit literature and that's what we're hearing a lot from and it's interesting because in the curriculum policy that that uh, the board just passed it's you can't have harmful material in curriculum and instructional materials and then it goes on to explain that that sexual content and violent content you know material that questions beliefs and practices and sex, morality, or religion. So we can't have that in instruction and teaching, but but then it's allowed in the library. And some, some of the library books wouldn't even be allowed to be read on the radio. They'd violate federal government standards. But then we have it in the classroom, I mean, in the library. Yes, and so in the procedures, um, and I believe, so correct me if I'm wrong, Dr. Forless, um, we develop those procedures. We share them with Dr. Forless through status, and then she provides those to you for input and feedback, and we would certainly consider your input and feedback as we're creating those procedures. Um, in cases where, again, where uh, there might be a challenge to the selection, and again, there's the legislation that was passed, and we updated our policies this past year regarding uh, the posting of all of our library books and ensuring that um, we let parents and community know when new purchases have been made and those kinds of things. Um, but if there is a challenge to what is in the library, there in the procedures that it would be very explicitly laid out what that process is in terms of bringing that forth to the principal um, where a committee would be developed and go through and vet those resources and or those library books um, and go through a decision-making process there. So those procedures are will be available for your, or might already be available for your review. Because I, I feel like this is an opportunity for the board to set standards for the district. So I, you, you know, you mentioned the word censorship, but the school library doesn't have to, isn't the end all and be all of books and reading. There's so much free reading that's out there. There's public, like city public libraries that have free books. There's a lot of places and certainly no one needs to stop anybody from starting their own library program at home. You know, I've seen homes and there's like the free library program out, you know, so there's no censorship from that. We don't have to, we don't, we're not banning the printing press or banning publications, but I think it's good for the district to have standards and age appropriate standards and to not, prom I don't think that promoting pornography and sexual activity is, is part of a, a diverse background or is really part of academic education. The, the kids will get plenty of that on their own. You know what I mean? Like, like if anyone's worried that, oh, they're not going to be exposed to enough stuff, they're getting exposed to everything. That doesn't mean that we have to encourage it, but we can just set standards and say, you know, as a public institution that recognizes the different backgrounds will be more neutral about it and, and follow, follow those basic standards of what's appropriate and not appropriate especially you know, based, based on age. And we've had some books brought in here and I've seen teachers send me books that are in the library, even in elementary school. And, and uh, I mean, that, that concerns me. You know? and, and I don't think our books are as bad as some of the other ones that I've seen in other districts, but we're gonna go that way if we don't set standards. Yeah, and I think that, again, the selection criteria within the procedures will help outline and define what those, those standards are for Mesa Public Schools. Okay, but we don't get to vote on it. The procedures, I don't think no, so. No, but we can certainly influence you can provide them. your input um, and and, and I and I've known Dr. Isla that you know when I whenever I write something out and I say I, I'd like to see this like we we've already talked about um, I li I'd like to see in the in the procedure um, that the library selection supports the portrait of a graduate that the library selection supports our promise that you know that that the library selection. Um, um, promotes the love and importance of reading. These are community standards, community values. They're district values, and I couldn't agree with you more that we have those values in the procedure. And so what I'm, I'm prepared to do is to 
you know, just type those up and and give them to her and discuss them with her. And and I'm sure that we can we can come to a, um, an agreement on procedures. Um, I also, when I listened to the, um, um, I believe it was the librarian from Kerr, um, and she mentioned some of the um, um, guidelines, criterion, if you will, from our old policy that are not in the new policy, but could be put in the procedures. And and she 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 rightly mentioned some of these that I think have given guidance to librarians, our resource center specialists, um, for years. And and oftentimes when they're they're you know they're trying to make that selection, which is crucial, um, they look at these criterion and go fits. Well, I'd also like to see them fit the, all the essential skills and attitudes of the portrait of a graduate too. And and so that we're that our libraries are supporting our mission and our values. And so um, I think if any of us have concerns about selection, that we 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 talk with, with Dr. Eastless and that we make those um, ideas known to her, discuss them with her, and I bet you you could be surprised they're going to be that you know our our ideas are going to be reflected in the procedures i i would like to add to that conversation about our procedures and specifically the portrait of the gra of a graduate and we talk about strength and need being a minority majority school district i would like to see more balance when it comes to what's represented in our library, who's represented, what the books look, look like. And um, yeah, I don't have to have to see the word Black Lives Matter, but I know that humanity matters and all Americans who have made contributions, especially um, when it comes to people of color, I would like to see a minority majority representation in our district. And when I say that, and at all levels, all grades, so it's very important for me to see that for it's a need of people. It is also speaking to the strength and actually the strength of America and that and nothing is more patriotic than all of those who have built and live and dwell and made America what we have working with today, a democracy. Okay, thank you very much. Is there any further discussion? My, my just last comment on this policy because I just I don't see how it's something that I could vote yes on because I feel like it's an example of something where as we're moving to new policies that what used to be an authority of the board is being taken away. And we don't have any right. We can give our feedback, but we don't have a right to update procedures. We allow the district to update the procedures. But, I, but if somebody disagrees with me, it's not going to be brought on the agenda for discussion. And, and the, the previous library policy seemed like there was more authority for the board in setting the tone of our libraries than this policy has. Mrs. Walden, I, I'll just, I'll just um, invite you, if you want to write policy, I'll be more than happy to put it on the agenda, and I welcome you to do that. Um, I, I we, we will we, we can work together as colleagues and and make that happen. Is there any further discussion on the policy? Seeing that there is none, Ms. Kirby, would you please take our vote? With a vote of four yay, one nay, we have passed policy 5-209. On to policy 5-210. Do I have a motion? So moved. Mrs. Sears has moved. Is there a second? Second. 
Ms. Davis has seconded. It's been moved and seconded to approve draft policy 5-210, special interest materials. Is there any board discussion? Seeing that there is none, Ms. Kirby, would you please take our vote? With a vote of four yeas and one abstention, we have passed policy 5-210. We're now at the point of looking at draft policy 5-211, class size. Is there a motion to approve draft policy 5-211, class size? So moved. Ms. Davis has moved. Is there a second? I second. Ms. Sears has seconded. It is moved and seconded to approve draft policy 5-211, class size. Is there any discussion? Seeing no discussion by the board, Ms. Kirby, would you please take our vote? With a vote of five yeas, zero nay, we have approved draft policy 5-211. The last second reading will be the revision of policy BDDH. Is there a motion to approve the revision of policy BDDH? So moved. Ms. Davis has moved. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, Mrs. Sears. It's been moved and seconded to approve the revision to policy BDDH. Is there any discussion? Seeing no discussion, Ms. Kirby, would you please take our vote? With a vote of five yeas and zero nay, we have approved the revision of policy BDDH. At this time, we come to the most favorite motion of the evening. Do I have a motion to adjourn? So moved. Ms. Sears has moved. Is there a second? No, Ms. Davis. Oh, sorry, Ms. Davis. Okay, do I have a second? Second. Ms. Sears has seconded, it's moved and seconded to adjourn the meeting. Ms. Kirby, will you please take our vote? With a vote of 5-0, we have adjourned the meeting.